OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. At half past seven this Wednesday morning, you're very welcome along to OTB AM. It's Sharon Owen with you all the way through until 10 a.m. Owen, how are you? Good morning. I believe my uh, headphones actually aren't working here. Two seconds. All right, uh, that's going to say you're bringing, oh, the, bringing the big energy. I, all I saw was your face appear on screen. I was like, I cannot hear that man speak. I can hear you now. Hey, I'm, Owen, how are you? I'm good. I've got uh, Bluetooth speakers on here, and they keep messing up on me whenever I go to watch either an Erling Haaland repeat reel from last night, that free kick that Ronaldo turned his back on, or anything involving audio whatsoever. So apologies, that's what I was doing. I was not doing uh, anything else on my laptop here. This is killing your brand, baby. This is killing your brand. You're one of the 30 under 30 uh, ones to watch from, uh, here we go, PwC Sport for Business 30 under 30 in 2021. Owen Sheehan, OTB Sports. You do look under 30 in that photograph, Owen. It's definitely, it's remarkable. Before that photo was taken, everybody was like, quick, quick, quick. He's about to get really old. So uh, let's get him into a photo booth and take a professional photograph so we remember what he actually looked like. So uh, thank, thank you for republishing that and reminding people that there once was a fresh face. Well, it, that was uh, one of the most remarked upon things last night. Uh, so Nathan goes, Bebo profile photo, classy. Uh, it, 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 I mean, it may well be your Bebo photo. And then Kevin Caban, uh, longtime friend of the show, all the way over from Canada, goes, not a hope that fella's under 30. Is that online abuse? <laughs> Which bit? The bit that he says you're not or the bit that we're pretending that you are? What age are you, Owen? Oh, God, what a, what a question on a, on a Wednesday morning here, which I'm using as filibustering to remember that I'm... Uh, I'm, I'm 26, which, like, I'm, I'm uh, pulling the clock back a, a full year on that once this pandemic is over. I propose that on top of an extra couple of bank holidays, when th once this is all over, everybody gets to go back to the age they were in March 2020. That's a good idea. We should so, definitely take that. I'm, I'm up for that. I, was... I, I, know, I know that, like, I mean, may, maybe some of our lockdown habits have ensured that we're actually going to lose years of our life in the actual end, so it doesn't make any sense. But I'm, I'm okay with resetting and uh, claiming to be 25 once I get vaccinated, if, uh, if everybody else is. Well, last summer, uh, I had decided with my mates that I was 42 at that stage and the lockdown had started. And I was like, whenever I'm asked from now on, I'm just going to say I'm 42. And that was it. And they were like, what do you mean? I was like, I've, I've stopped aging. It's like, no, you can't do that. I'm like, well, actually, you can. Who cares? What's the difference? Yeah. Who cares? Oh, I'm with you. I'm like, I guess maybe you're in a different stage where you're in the early part of a decade where you're like, ah, it doesn't matter. I've got loads of years left in this. Whereas I'm in that precarious position now where it's like, God, tilting over three, three years left in the twenties. Like that, that becomes a, a far different situation. And for me, I'm like, I'm, I'm happy being, being stuck at 20. <sighs> it's, it's like, I would be happy enough to play with house money at this point. I like just say if somebody said you can stay 25 forever or you can maybe take a gamble that being 30 something or 40 something will actually be better. I would be like, nah, write that off. Let's let's call it quits right now. I would press pause and uh, uh, and not age anymore from this point. Look, I think that's an excellent point and we should all row in behind it. One last point on this. A branchy and clearly pointing up uh, all day yesterday, trending in the right direction. Uh, everybody now knows that you're definitely not over 30 and um, there's been, a, you know, you, you look a little bit older, I've got to say, from today than you did in the photograph. But um, not good for your brand was the last bit of uh, comment that we had here was, I stood behind at Owen Sheehan at a Jungle Forever gig a few years ago. The lad never stopped talking. I saw this tweet and I was like, nothing could be further from the truth. This, like, I'm, I'm not sure which Jungle gig that was. I've seen them multiple times. Uh, and I, can, I, I think that the, what he must be talking about was the gig at the Olympia at the start of uh, 2019. Uh, like, I, I don't want to throw any fellow OTB heads under the bus here, but Stephen Doyle was also uh, right there beside me at that. And if I was talking a lot, then he was probably talking a lot. So, oh. uh, it, it, so I, like, I, I don't care. You can besmirch my character all you want. Is Stephen Doyle the type of guy who would talk through a gig? Absolutely not. So I think I'm uh, pretty much exonerated. It was an absolutely... no. Awful. It was not oh, so sorry. It was an awful place to stand. One of those places where you are the passageway. You know, sometimes where you're like, okay, there's just going to be people walking through me at every single point in this gig. It was one of those things. Please believe me when I say that. I, I hate people who talk through gigs. But uh, like, I, well, I, I wasn't silent. No, but no, there was a on. lot of people walking through me. I was a corridor. Stephen, Stephen being quiet and respectful 
does not equate to you being silent and respectful. I, I would I would say that you're the type to have like a bit of a running commentary through a gig going, oh yeah, oh. This, this bit, there, these are great. Did you see what your man just did there, over there? Oh yeah. Just saying, just saying. That's the, that's what certainly yeah. that's what the evidence of the, the public is telling us today. The, 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 the well, spies and watchers out there have been have outed you as a chatter during a gig. Well, I guess at that point I would have been like 24 and a half, whereas now I'm 26. So uh, times have changed, Mr. Tweeter, who uh, kept, weirdly kept an eye on me and then didn't DM me afterwards, but uh, tweeted it publicly. Who holds on to that sort of information for years? And then it's like, uh, evil genius, going to unleash it. Uh, on my proudest day in my life. What a, what a cruel thing to do. Kevin the Moner, it turns out. All right, 87 9180 is the number if you want to get in touch with us this morning. And please do give Owen his congratulations, uh, his due, the due deference for uh, being one of um, Sport for Business 30 under 30, sponsored by PWT to watch. Uh, let's talk about Cristiano Ronaldo. Is, that, is, this the, is this the end of the Ronaldo being a competent potential winner of the Champions League every year? that they get knocked out. It's the same with Messi. Every year that they get knocked out, you're like, just don't see them getting a squad together in enough time for them to have an opportunity to win this tournament. And uh, quite a weird way, fitting in a way, for Ronaldo's vanity to get in the way. Yeah, like Juventus's record since signing Cristiano Ronaldo is desperate in the Champions League, despite the fact that signing Cristiano Ronaldo was done so that they could win the Champions League. They got to the final in two to four years before they signed Ronaldo, and for the third straight season since signing him, they have failed to progress past the quarterfinals in the, the Champions League. Obviously, they're not even getting to the, champion, to the Champions League quarterfinals this season. This could be the moment where there is a new chapter written in the Messi versus Ronaldo debate, but it probably won't be, because Messi is more than likely crashing out of the Champions League tonight. There was an opportunity here for Messi to really stick it to the Ronaldo fans and say, listen, he was there as part of a team of Galacticos in Madrid. I'm doing it with uh, a weakened Barcelona team, a post Suarez team. Kids. But unfortunately, they've got beaten uh, Paris, by Paris Saint-Germain in that first leg so comfortably that they're probably not going to qualify. Uh, so there, there is no extra chapter to this. And it was one of Ronaldo's, maybe one of his lowest moments in the Champions League last night, I want to say. Like, he is firmly the scapegoat for what happened. Well... Just because a lot of people might have gone to bed, uh, they got they they should have essentially they should have won the game because they're playing against the Porto side who were down to ten men, and uh, Porto took an early lead on the night, which gave them a three-one cushion, obviously, and an away goal, which was important. And then Juve got it back, two-one on the night they lead, and three all on aggregate. It goes into extra time, and ten-man Porto, you assume, are absolutely shattered and essentially just playing for penalties until um, until they score a free kick with like five minutes left to go. And the, for the free kick, the wall essentially crumbles. Ronaldo turns his back and the ball goes through his legs. But the free kick is from like 170 yards out. And unfortunately, Juventus have made the slight oversight of having Wojciech Szczesny in goals. And so Szczesny sees the ball. Oh look, it's coming. It's coming. I should kind of get over that, shouldn't I? I should, oh. And then palms it gently into the side netting. Like, oh, welcome. Come, you know the way um, the phraseology in a sports bulletin is like, uh, Everton entertain Liverpool at uh, Goodison Park. Wojciech Chesney entertains the ball into the net. Oh, come on in. Hey, old friend. Uh, why did the ball cross the road? You know, like that's what Wojciech Chesney did. Instead of just palming the ball back out, like goalkeepers are supposed to have, they're supposed to do some big hands, big kind of giant hands and gloves that, whoosh, oh. Decent save, but one you'd expect him to make, given he'd seen the ball from 100 yards out. I think Chesney's at fault. Chesney immediately blames the wall. The wall does not do its job, it's true. The wall is a weak wall. The wall is one of those Trump walls, which, you know, is like a little, little bit here and then a little bit there and a big hole in the middle. The ball goes through that. I don't know if you can just blame Ronaldo. I think you can certainly blame Ronaldo for a huge dose of what happens turning your back on a free kick that goes along the ground is not a reaction that even... You, you don't even need to be Roy Keane to accept that that's not how you should react okay, to a free okay. kick. Sorry, I, I paused it this morning. <coughs> on a point of information, he didn't turn his back on the ball when it was kicked along the ground. He didn't know it was going to be a daisy cutter because he was so cowardly, he turned his back before it was even kicked. Like, it was an idiotic piece of, of play from Cristiano Ronaldo. I'm saying that there's a cocktail of blame here, like a nicely shaken cocktail. 
and Ronaldo has his partner because if he had just stood there, the ball would have bounced off his legs and it wouldn't have been very sore. I don't know why he's no. turning. Like It's much easier to avoid the ball when you know where it's, where it's coming, whereas if you turn your back, there was a chance he was going to get hit in the head or the ass or wherever. But it's his vanity. It's to protect the face, the moneymaker. That's the problem. Or Cristiano Ronaldo knows exactly where a free kick should be going, and he's seen his free kicks smash into the faces of opposition walls on so many times that he's actually just the worst guy to, to stand in a wall. Like I like they're, they're both to blame here, no question. The other two in the wall as well are to blame. Uh, Chesney, like I mean, the the unfortunate thing about having Chesney there is what you said. Like I mean, he was a former Premier League Golden Glove winner. He was a Serie A best goalkeeper two seasons ago or last season even. Like this guy is a good goalkeeper and it looks He's almost made the case that goalkeepers can get tired after 120 minutes. That's that was how that's what his save represented last night, which is obviously uh, nonsense. But the big winner here is those people who have spent some part of their playing career to date lying down at the back of walls. Those people are vindicated this morning after seeing that last night. All it would have taken was an Alexander Zinchenko lying down behind, getting screamed at by Ederson, telling him to lie down behind the Manchester City wall. He is the guy who's waking up this morning saying. Told you. That makes sense. Or, or like uh, back in the olden days, Billy used to put a man on the on the post. Plays everybody on side, but nobody ever scores a goal against you. So. Well, Ches I presume Chesney would have taken that post and put the man on the other post, and Chesney's weak arms still would have let them down. You can't legislate for weak arms as a goalkeeper, it turns out. Uh, so I'm, I'm blaming Chesney more than Ronaldo. You're blaming Ronaldo slightly more than Chesney. Who's to blame? That's our... That's our uh, overarching question this morning. Uh, all right, if you want to get in touch with us uh, now, would be a good time. 0879 180 180, and uh, we will uh, read your comments out, or you can leave a comment on the stream as well. OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Here's what's coming up with the show between now and 10 o'clock this morning for you. Got to talk to Rory O'Connor at 7.50 about the Irish rugby team and the uh, really must-win game for Ireland against Scotland this weekend. Rory Lawson, the former Scottish scrum half, is going to join us at 8.15 and in between we'll run you through the sports pages. John Duggan's a virtual insanity. It's gone great guns. Uh, 2021, brand new year for him. He had um, a 70 to 1 shot in the uh, top eight last week. Uh, HSE quits. That's the story of the Irish kit man who's given up the fags. That's at 8.45. Five past nine. We're talking Liverpool with Simon Hughes. The news came through yesterday that Jurgen Klopp is staying with Liverpool, according to him, which is kind of the most important part. He says he's got three years left in his deal. It's a simple, he's not going to take Yogi Love's job. And then we're talking about a new report into the dropout rate for uh, girls in sport in particular. Uh, we'll hear about that from about half past nine this morning. If you want to get in touch with us, as I said, 0879-180-180. Phil Egan is with us this morning at 7.43. Phil, good morning to you. How are you doing, lads? A cocktail of blame. I'm in favour of blaming Chesney. Owen has Ronaldo. Who have you got? Uh, the, uh, there's, I think the, there's a few of them in it. And I think definitely they were missing the draft excluder. That's the, the draft excluder is the, the player that lies down behind the wall and it doesn't get through. I think that's the best description I've heard of that player. That <laughs> uh, Owen referenced it as Zinchenko. I, what I remember about Zinchenko was Ruben Diaz grabbing him by the head and moving him. <laughs> uh, like you used to do when you had a a sunny snake on your your door to try and keep the draft out so the draft excluder wasn't there but yeah Ronaldo should never be in a wall because Ronaldo is never taking a, a ball flush in the face and with those good looks who could blame him but yeah a, a terrible wall and keeper could have done better so I think all of them when they're in the changing room after that match last night they'd all have their heads down thinking yeah I can't really have a go at him because he was at fault Rabio wasn't exactly brilliant either so yeah I think a lot of people to blame and um, I don't think too many people sad to see Juventus go out given all the talk from Agnelli about uh, this new Champions League format trying to get rid of teams like Porto and Porto dump the old lady out yeah I, 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 it, it's interesting that everybody's on board with the shithousery of Porto all of a sudden it, like is it because we've become incapable of feeling anything from football, Phil. And all of a sudden, there's this villain on the pitch and Pepe and Gruyich uh, peeking out from behind his eyes. And we're like, God, I feel a little bit of distaste. This is good because it's just something that isn't a bland reaction to football. It seems like everybody was on board for Porto to win that last night. I feel with players like Pepe, when they get towards the end of their career, you kind of warm to them. I've had people like sports people like this before. 
I obviously like my boxing and maybe it was just the Steve Collins, Chris Eubank rivalry where I didn't like Chris Eubank, but by the end of his career, I was like, this guy is unbelievable. I was watching him fight Carl Thompson, cheering him on going, the bravery he's showing there. Why did I not like this guy? This guy is so courageous. So now Pepe has obviously left Real Madrid. He's an underdog. And you're watching him there play last night and he's putting his body on the line and you're thinking, yeah, I like this guy. How did this happen? All of a sudden, I've got this uh, man crush on Pepe. I want to, I want more players like Pepe. <laughs> uh, the one, one thing I would love to see over the next little while is Jose Mourinho to go back to Porto, because like this would just be the perfect combination of, as I say, nasty individuals who collectively actually there's a, a bit to like about them. If he could just get sacked from Tottenham this season and go back to this particular group of. FC Porto players. I think that would be just an unbelievable collection of players who would wind a lot of opposition up. Absolutely. And there was characteristics and traits in that performance last night that reminded me of that Mourinho Porto team. You don't have to talk about Porto to Celtic fans because that UEFA Cup final in 2003, they absolutely shit house Celtic that day and frustrated them so much. That the only thing is now watching Mourinho, would he have the energy to burst down the touchline at Old Trafford? If Porto got that all important goal like they did in, in 04, I'm not so sure. But um, yeah, I, I, look, fair play to Porto, but let's be honest, all the teams in the quarter final draw will want Porto. Yeah, I, um, I'm just trying to look up. Uh, Pepe, I think, did, he, did Pepe win three Champions Leagues? Would it, would it have been more than that? He was definitely, well, you think of obviously they won three in a row, they won four and five. So you're, you're thinking he was there for at all least them. three. Yeah. Not a bad career, really, when you think about it. And still going strong at this stage. Um, maybe when he left Real Madrid, there was probably a bunch of English teams who could have signed him. It's funny that those type of players, when they come to the Premier League, tend to get on quite well, but it doesn't happen that often. Um, you know, like, I'm going to be very interested to see what happens. Sergio Ramos, for example, I think he'd be. Uh, Really interesting to watch. Um, anyway, look, that was a, a needless diversion. Where else are we going, Phil? Well, obviously, I watched the extra time on that one. I decided to watch the Dortmund Sevilla game because I just like watching Erlen Haaland, and he came up with the goods again. Two goals, and um, they obviously drew two all with Sevilla. And Sevilla actually had a chance towards the end to send that one into to extra time. But um, yeah, that, that that was a cracking game. Obviously, Dortmund threw five four in aggregate. A bit like Porto, I think a lot of teams wouldn't mind facing Dortmund because. As good as Haaland is, they certainly look like they had frailties at the back. But i tell you one thing, 17-year-old Jude Bellingham, what a player he is. He was unbelievable last night. And you would imagine he's only just going to get better. And there was talk of him going to Premier League clubs, decided to go to Dortmund. Obviously, try and follow the same path as somebody like Jaden Sancho, where you go to a big European club. And already, it looks like it, it was a wise decision. And he's playing first-team football. He's into the quarterfinals of the Champions League. But... An absolute Rolls Royce of a player by the looks of it. What does he play? Where, more... does he, where does he play? He plays in midfield, but he can do it all. He can carry the ball. He's a great passer. He's, you know, he's, he seems to have a really good attitude, a good temperament as well, and just a, a serious engine on him as well. Just kept going up and down and very impressive. And, you know, there was a lot of talk when he was at Birmingham how good he was and he was standing out in a team in the championship, which isn't always easy as a, as a teenager, as a young teenager, because given the physicality of the championship. But, um, yeah, he looks like a, he's obviously already been capped for England as well at senior level. So right. that guy that guy could be, you know, one of the, the best midfielders the, in Europe. In, the right decision for years. Birmingham to retire his jersey then, Phil, is, is what you're saying, because he's the guy they're going to have. Uh, yeah. And uh, Haaland had a goal disallowed that was like a worldie. Yeah, he basically just did what Haaland does. He just out-muscles somebody and uh, gets called back for the penalty. Misses the penalty, but it gets retaken because Bono was off his line. Gives a few verbals back to Bono, and everyone thought, oh, that's a bit of a, out of order from Haaland. But the replay then from a few minutes before had shown when Bono saved the first penalty and then saved the follow-up, he gave the verbals to Haaland. So you know, they, they laughed it off at the end. But I had to laugh at the Sevilla players running after Haaland because you get to him and then you realise, oh, God, what am I going to do? He is just going to... Like, he would take them all on. He's just an absolute monster. And uh, 20 goals in the Champions League and 14 appearances. And again, Phil, who, who's going to sign him? Who who can afford the transfer fee? 
did, did you see Haaland's explanation after the game for his altercation with, with Bono? So, so he was asked about what was said when he screams in Bono's face. And he said, the goalkeeper shouted at me when he saved the penalty. And I thought, oh, I hope I can score another goal for you. And I did. I have no idea what he shouted. I said the same thing he said to me. I don't know what it means. So Erling Haaland goes up to Bono and is screaming something in his face that he doesn't even know what it means. Like, this is absolute strutting your talent at such a young age. I love it. Yeah. Like, there, there is one eventuality here that I saw for a brief moment last night, Bill. Is there a possibility that Erling Haaland becomes just a far more talented version of Diego Costa? Because he loves winding opposition players up. Yeah, but I think the difference with him and Costa is Haaland wants to score goals all the time. Not that Costa didn't want to score goals, but there was often games where Costa would get involved in more of the, the antics rather than actually concentrating on the game. And Haaland's prime target is to score goals, and then the rest of this is um, comes with it. But he just loves scoring goals. And his first goal was very similar to the one that he scored against Munich at the weekend, the second one against Munich, where... He just pulls off the, the defender and just gets a bit of space and has an easy enough finish. And yeah, he just loves scoring goals. So I, I get the, the comparisons in terms of the physicality and how he enjoys the, the gamesmanship with the opposition. But uh, I think he's just he, he's going to be a different level. And the only thing I, I wonder, he's so young. I'd be interested to see, just given the, the size of him, what, what, what his injury profile is going to be like. I mean, so far he's looked bionic, so uh, yeah. and that obviously isn't going to last. Okay, let's move on because um, there's plenty more to get to. Yeah, obviously Liverpool in action tonight in dreadful form in the Premier League, but uh, they were very good against Leipzig in the first leg three weeks ago. Again, this game is in Budapest, but this is a home leg for Liverpool. So there is the possibility Liverpool could lose 3-1 tonight and go out on away goals without playing a game at, at home. But this is just the, the nature of the tournament at the moment with coronavirus travel restrictions. Roberto Firmino, a bit of a doubt for the game. Didn't train yesterday due to a knee injury. The other game looks like it's done and does with PSG and Barcelona. PSG 4-1 up this second leg in Paris. Both games kick off at 8 o'clock. At 6 o'clock before that one, you've got Premier League action. Manchester City are at home to Southampton. A win for City would move them 14 points clear of Manchester United once again. And City play Fulham at the weekend. You're thinking with 10 games to go, if they win five of them, that should be enough. So they, they could be almost halfway there by uh, the, by the weekend before United even kick a ball in the Premier League next when they play West Ham. Speaking of United, Edison Cavani on the back of most of the papers this morning, his dad has made comments saying that his son doesn't feel comfortable. He could move back to South America. One of the clubs being mentioned is Boca Juniors. Now, Cavani posted a photo on Instagram last night of him playing for United. And the caption said, proud to wear this shirt. So... It's hard to know who's telling the truth here. Also, Bruno Fernandes on the back of some of the papers saying that he wants to see that United are going to spend some cash, find some players before he commits to signing a new long-term contract. And Rory McIlroy says he's no plans to change his caddy or his coach as he gears up to defend his players' championship title. Uh, the defending champion admitted that he was uh, somewhat dejected after the final round of the Arnold Palmer invitation where he shot at the final round 76. But he said maybe he'd look to go in a different direction. Now, he said that was in the heat at the moment. So uh, I know you'll be talking more about Rory McIlroy at half eight with John. Yeah, um, not great. If you're uh, the coach or the caddy, it's like, oh, OK. So yes, I'm the first one that you reach for whenever uh, things aren't going great. Phil, thanks very much for that. More from Phil. Thanks, guys. Across the day on otbsports.com and uh, on the OTB Sports app. Uh, we're going to talk rugby with Roy O'Connor in just a moment. Um, are we, are, are you, do you want to troll Scotland there before? Uh, anything, <laughs> anything you want to do with that there? Uh, anything? Scotland's a great nation and we respect them uh, with all our hearts in uh, this country and uh, we just hope for a good, clean, fair game of rugby this weekend because that is the only thing you can say before Six Nations came. Roy Lawson's going to be with us in uh, just a little while. Brian Dillon on YouTube says, lads, it's the keeper's job to organise the wall. If you watch it back, it's all over the shop. He's roaring and bawling and never gets the wall set up. And um, Sport for Business have been in touch and say, nice to get a shout out this morning. Congrats, Owen, though I was a little uncertain of your 30 under 30 inclusion when you couldn't work your headphones. I'm sure, there has to be room for improvement. Yeah, don't <laughs> worry, we'll, we'll fix that. We'll definitely fix that. We'll get there. Uh, right, um, Roy O'Connor is with us at 7.55. Rory, good morning to you. How are you? Hey, that's how's it going? This is, uh, you know, 
I mean, I hate to say like a big, big, big must win game, but this is a big, big, big must win game for Andy Farrell and the coaching ticket. The, the pressure has ratcheted up to such a point where you don't really want to see what happens if they lose. Well, I mean, yeah, the the vista where where they lose is very is a very interesting one and a very dangerous one because I think you go into an England game, but well, sorry, you just it's factually you go into an England game with one win out of four against a, a horrible Italy team, and um, you know I think all the talk that was there going into the last Scotland game creeps back in about Andy Farrell and whether he's the right man for the job. There's only one way to head that off of the pass, and that's to perform, you know, to build on that Italy performance, which. You know, I don't think Ireland have played particularly badly so far in, in, in a lot of facets in the Six Nations, but they still need to get results. It's a results business. Um, they were very pleased with the way they played against Italy, um, noticeably so. And if they can build on that and play as well as they thought they did against Italy, I think then they have enough to beat Scotland. We know they have enough to beat Scotland. And they put themselves nicely kind of set up to finish strong with it, with another you know, to back it up against England in the last game. But I think going into that England game as a must win to avoid being the best, no, sorry, the worst of the five good teams in the Six Nations um, is not a particularly good place to be for, for Ireland at this stage. What are we, 12 or 13 games with Andy Farrell's reign? That's the, the glass half empty side of things. But the glass half full side of things would be if you were to win these two games, then you'd be looking at the sending off in the game against potentially the Grand Slam champions, Wales, what a ridiculous uh, scenario that would be. And then the French, who actually are a really, really good team, who we were in with a chance of winning uh, that game, although we didn't create very much. Um, you know, so like, there's definitely, there's a, that's why this game is such a pivot, that if things go well, then you can say, okay, we have momentum, we have some confidence, we're, we're building and progressing. If things go badly, it could be a juddering halt to any of the signs of progress that you've made. Yeah, absolutely. And we don't know what's coming this summer. So we don't know what, like, one of the big problems for Andy Farrell, I think, has been the lack of continuity over the course of his first year. Like, obviously, we had that spurt of games in October, November and December. But, you know, normally he would have had that Six Nations with his old stagers, maybe a summer tour to, to launch a few new players into a, an autumn series. I think the All Blacks were supposed to be here last last autumn, you know, to kind of build a bit of momentum into the Six Nations. That hasn't been there. So we're dealing in these kind of really intense, important bursts of games. And, I mean, for all of there were mitigating factors about the defeats to Wales and France, I mean, the sending off was within Ireland's control. One of the senior leaders went and got himself sent off. So I don't think we can write that off as, oh, well, they got a red card. They did respond very well to that and could have still won the game, um, although it was their own defensive uh, deficiencies that led Wales to, to win that game really. Uh, France similar, you know, it was their own lack of ambition it was their own lack of control, obviously it was missing five or six of their senior players which is, you know is probably more mitigated I, I, you know, one of them obviously got himself suspended but the rest were injured so um, no, you're, you're, you're right, like this, like one of the things like this coaching taker, while they have made some changes, haven't made very, very vast changes this is still a very experienced team 10 obviously has been the issue we've talked about a lot, but around the number 10, it's it's a very established group of players, pretty much, you know, you've got one or two who've come in and help, uh, helped out, but really, this is not really, shouldn't really be a team in transition when you look at the names in the team sheet. In France, yeah, it was a lot of disruption, but if you look at the team they're going to put out this weekend and the players that they're possibly going to be leaving out, you know, they should be at a stage where they're winning these games, and while you maybe would have forgiven a, w a defeat away to a good Scotland team in Murrayfield if they'd won the first two games and we were kind of, it was a disappointing, you know, Grand Slam derailment. You, you know, you'd be disappointed, but you wouldn't be writing them off. I think if you've lost the three games against the good teams and you're coming up against the one team that always beats you up and beats beats you well in the final game, it's a pretty very it's a pretty tough spot to be in. Gordon Darcy in, today, uh, in the Irish Times today is saying that second viewing of the Ireland-Italy game wasn't particularly good, that we weren't very creative. I, I, I totally understand that. And I, I, uh, you know, he's talking particularly about the, using the forwards to pound away at the Italians as opposed to trying to be creative. Part of me wonders, though, when you are a man up and when you know you're going to win the game, do you reveal all of your hands or are you supposed to just play your best stuff and try and practice it? I'm, I'm never quite sure in those games where you know you're going to win what you're supposed to do? Yeah, the player's instinct probably is, and a team's instinct is to take the most direct route to the, the try line that they can. And if they sense weakness within that Italian high five and they think they can get over, then I, I think it's very hard 
say, no, lads, we need to develop our attacking game. Let's let's come away from that. And I think that game was very disjointed in terms of the way it was refereed, and there was a lot of stoppages. I mean, Ireland had three tries chalked off. One was, you know, one was a try. One was slightly harsh. You know, maybe if James Lowe's try had stood, we might be looking at it a bit more um, in a bit more forgiving light. I thought this, the first half uh, attack was, was very good. When, when it was 15 on 15 in Italy were good. They did, and again, it is Italy, and, and you probably have that extra little bit of space, but if they can develop, and I'm not sure they're going to go to Murrayfield and throw loads of offloads and stuff, but it's it's throwing the right offload at the right time, making the right decision when you have a three on one and you don't kick the ball and you know the, with, that you move the ball through the hands or you draw your man. It's the little like I don't think anyone's checking, che- looking for right maybe not right now a fundamental revolution in Ireland's game plan. What we really want to see is that when the when when the opportunity is there for the players that they take the opportunity that's on. I do watch the Pro 14 sometimes and the way that say provinces tend to play like Exeter a little bit where they kick the ball into the, not all of them, but Leinster, the successful ones really, you know, like we, we, last Saturday night, we pretty much saw a succession of, of pick and go tries because at that level, that's the easiest way to score. So you, you create a bit, you win, a, you force a penalty, you kick to the corner, you, 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 you probably force another penalty and tap and go and, and hammer your way over the line. And, I'm not sure against the biggest teams at the international level. Maybe Scotland, Ireland have kind of demonstrated an ability to do it against Scotland, but I don't know if it's going to work as you go up against the better teams. And certainly Ireland have, have failed to be to, to beat England that way. And, and, you know, we can't talk about beating England until we've beaten, beaten Scotland at this stage. But I do think beating Italy that way doesn't set you up to potentially, sorry, that second half performance doesn't really set you up to succeed against better teams who will just front up and, and, and repel you there and force you into an error. Uh, it, it was an all Leinster backline against Italy, Rory, and I think maybe one of the frustrations that people have had in general with Irish rugby over the last few years is how are Leinster performing so well and Ireland's aren't. And obviously it's a vastly different level when it comes from provincial rugby to, to test rugby. Uh, at the same time, is there a little bit of pressure on the likes of James Lowe over the next little while to, to prove that he is a guaranteed starter, especially when you have someone like Jacob Stockdale coming back into the squad? I, I don't think... I mean, I'm not sure if we want guaranteed starters in the Irish team. I think sure. everyone's everyone should go out every week. And, and like James Lowe having Jacob Stockdale this, this week in camp should have should be lighting a fire up under him. I, I showed it for Hugo Keenan because, you know, he was he was the fullback um, for um, for a lot of the November kind of window. So, um, Lowe is definitely, again, there were signs against Italy. I don't think Lowe is as, as fully become comfortable in the Irish jersey yet. I think there are, I think he's been asked to do a job at this level that sometimes negates the kind of reasons he got into the jersey in the first place. We haven't seen him being able to kind of cut loose in the way he does for Leinster. Like he's the king of the Pro 14. He's like the, the, the absolute box office at that level. And when he first played for Ireland against Wales, he kind of brought all of that. And, and like he was fighting with Liam Williams. He scored a try at the end. He was throwing offloads. And there have been glimpses of that. But really, his most notable co- contribution in Ireland jersey so far really has been with his left boot, which is something that he's always had in his locker if you go back to his time in New Zealand. But it hasn't really been something that Leinster have. But certainly, it hasn't been what Sean... Uh, it's not what you've never left the RDS and gone, Jesus, you know, James Lowe's left boot was good tonight. You know, he's always it's always been other other elements of his game. Like Stockdale is an interesting one. Like the, he's he's obviously he's a centrally contracted player. He's the he, he he was pretty much picked and he was he was on the bench for one of the games in, in, in the autumn series. So he, he has been an automatic starter since twenty eighteen, really since he burst on the scene in all in all his glory. At the moment, you've got yeah, Earls. Earls is on the bench. You got Larmer on one wing, and you've got Low on the other wing. Does he force his way onto the bench? Does he force his way onto one of the wings? How, how does how does that look? I mean, I think it will be. You know, you've invested so much into Low at this stage. Do you just keep going with him for the rest of this tournament because you know he can get better and he will get better? Or do you put Stockdale in, who's shown you know glimpses for Ulster, but probably doesn't look fully up to speed? I, I think you probably stick with him at, at this stage. But do you then? drop Earls you know, out of the match day squad and put Stockdale in, in that number 23 shirt or do you do a bit of a, a, a workaround and you take Larmer out of things I, you know, I don't think you do that either because there's too much upside in Larmer and there's too much impact in the bench up there so there's, there's one of the good things at the moment is there is great discussions about a number of positions across the squad and, and, and you'd hope that those discussions are not um, only around experience, they're about kind of what a player can bring in terms of their attacking potential So nine is the other big discussion point right? It's like um... Gibson Park, 
not first choice for Leinster, but all of a sudden is playing well. And uh, you know, Brian O'Driscoll was uh, ooing and aahing about the quality of, and speed of his pass. Not since Stringer have we had somebody who passes the ball from nine like that for Ireland. That's a big deal if you are my cat and wondering, well, I'm taking all this flack from my team not being particularly creative. And then all of a sudden there's a bit of a creative spark in there. He beds down, gets a bit of experience playing, starting. And yet there's strong speculation that we're going back to Murray to start the game against Scotland. I don't. I, I think Murray will come back into the 23. I, I'm not sure he'll start. Uh, Murray came into this tournament in very good form, but didn't play well against Wales. And, and mostly what he did badly against Wales was, was, was discipline-wise, which was, which was strange. He gave away a couple of, of bad penalties. I, I don't see... I don't know why why you would take Gibson Park out of the team at this stage, unless it's very much a game plan decision. Unless they've... I mean, I, I don't know why you box kick to Stuart Hogg anyway. So... Really, what you want to be doing against Scotland is keeping the ball because when when you have the ball, they're less they're less of a dangerous team. They're they're less of a threat. And if you want a continuity from half who's able to challenge the, the defensive line, right now, Gibson Park is the better option. And um, I do see the value in, in in having Murray in the 23. And I I wouldn't write Conor Murray off at, at all at this stage. He's still only 31, and and I really am excited to see what Conor Murray will do now that he's been properly challenged. I mean, Carroll did take him out of the Twickenham team back in November and started Gibson Park there. And I think we did see a response from Conor Murray. Um, whether it's good enough, you know, you know whether... like the, It's also, you have to be conscious of the fact that it's two games in six days, um, the second one being against England. So there, I think there will be an element of picking, you know, a 23 that maybe rotates between the two and maybe some players come in. So maybe he's looking, I don't know, does he think, does he see Murray as a starter, uh, sorry, against England and Dublin? I think he should stick with Gibson Park because I think he needs to reward form. And, and like, you can't say that you were delighted against, you know, about the way the team played against Italy, having made your seven changes. Well, you can, but you shouldn't. And then drop all the players who brought about that change. That was one of the mistakes Ireland made at the World Cup was that the, the second spring team was better than the first string team towards the end. And the likes of Luke McGrath, Reese Ruddock, Dave Kilcoyne, Jordan Larmer and Andrew Conway found themselves either on the bench or out of the squad for the most important game when the players who hadn't been playing well were brought back in. So I think if you rotated and the players you rotated did well, well, there's no reason, even if they're less experienced, those are the players that you should start in the in, in the next big game. And it should be a challenge to Conor Murray to basically train the house down and come off the bench next Saturday or Sunday and give the game of his life which, you know, if Conor Murray can get up to that standard, then Conor Murray is undroppable because he's, you know, the, the Conor Murray who beat the All Blacks, you know, not on his own, but was the best player against the All Blacks in 2016. So I think stick with it's a park, but I think I can see the, the merits in bringing Murray back off the bench, having given Craig Casey a taste. Again, at the same time, Casey did really well the last time. So, you know, what message does it send to him if you leave him out for the more experienced guy? It's, it's, it's a tricky selection business. Um, it depends on Murray's training, and obviously we don't get access to that. But I, I understand why they will be looking at Murray. It's one of the more overlooked facts here as well, Rory, the fact that the Irish coaching team probably had their starting back row, for example, nailed down before the tournament starts. And Doris gets injured, Peter O'Mahony gets sent off immediately. I wonder, does that just factor into them being a little bit more conservative when it comes to their picks in the backs? I don't think so because I think the back row went well. Um, I I think like Doris probably does come back in when he's fit and he's and he's firing. You know, I, I'm not a huge fan of CJ Sander at, at eight. I I like more traditional number eight, and I prefer to see Jack Conan, who Andy Farrell absolutely raved about. And um, I think Jack Conan and, and Doris are a proper, you know, blue chip number eight. Whereas Stander is is an unbelievable six, but when you move him there, he he doesn't have the the game sense or the kind of the, the, the game management element that you need from your number eight and he doesn't have the evasiveness that say a, a Conan or a standard do and um, at the same time six looks like it's tight burgers jersey now so like you know that that combination of Fern Connors and Stander went really well and Conan made a difference off the bench so I think that gives you comfort to pick whoever you want in the back line um, and I think that actually that back line is, is 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 a form back line I don't know if there's much you know if Murray's injured and Earls hasn't played brilliantly, I don't think. And I think Larmer gives you an, an awful lot. Um, Aki came into the tournament injured, and that Leinster centre partnership is, is very good. You know, I, I don't see a huge amount of, you know, Stockdale side again coming back from injury. I, I think that they're just the best players in those positions at the moment. I, I don't see a huge amount of reason to go and change that based on, I don't, 
you know, I think Andy Farrell's right to be colorblind when picking his international squad. I don't think politics should come into it. I don't think pressure from outside should come into it. If he thinks that, that you know, if, if, if it was 15 Munster, Leinster, Ulster, Connacht, like if they're the best Irish qualified players to play, play for the team, that's his responsibility to pick them. So um, I don't see a problem with the all Leinster backline as such. I do think, you know, we're going to see Balakoon come through. I think Stockdale will have a say. I think Stockdale is, you know, is probably you know in Ireland's best team when fit and firing. I think Murray can get to that level, back to that level as well. Um, Aki obviously has been brilliant for Ireland over the past. So I don't think this is a long-term thing. We're going to look at the Leinster backline for, forever. I just think right now those players are playing well and, and probably deserve to be selected. All right, Rory, good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Cheers. Cheers, have a good day. Rory O'Connor, the Irish Independent, there giving us some thoughts this morning. If you want to get in touch, 0879-180-180. Who should start for Ireland at nine? Who should start for Ireland on the wing? Uh, give us your opinions and we'll talk to them, uh, talk about them a little bit later on on the show. Rory Lawson is uh, standing by. We're going to talk to him in a couple of minutes' time. running through the sports pages. In the meantime, first, a quick break. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. This is OTB Sports Radio. When Matt Busby signed me, I joined a club with three European footballs a year, a World Cup winner. Unbelievable to play with Bestie. Matt Busby management was incredible. He picked players like a jigsaw puzzle. He didn't pressurise you. Go out and enjoy yourself. He never swore. Matt Busby never swore. Can you imagine that from a manager today? He never swore. Off the ball, Saturdays from 1 on OTB Sports Radio. Listen live on the OTB Sports app. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna automower. Automower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawnmower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so... Ah, no can do, love. I have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna Automower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie. Get ready for the Cheltenham Festival with the Boyle Sports app. With a special offer guaranteed on every race, every day of the festival, plus extra places on each-way bets over all four days. The Boyle Sports app has got you covered. Need to study up? Check out our Racing Post insights or watch our exclusive video previews with Cheltenham Gold Cup winning jockey Robbie Power. The Cheltenham Festival on the faster-than-ever Boyle Sports app. Boyle Sports. This is betting. Gamble responsibly. See gamblingcare.ie. 18 plus. Tom Watson, you're welcome to Golf Weekly. Hey, this is going to be fun. Very happy to say European captain and, of course, three-time major winner, Padre Carrington, joins us. Today's special guest on Golf Weekly is Lee Westwood. Thank, <laughs> thanks very much. Yeah, I'm honoured and delighted. Let's bring in Paul McGinley, who joins us now. Paul, you're very welcome. Shane Lowry, how are you keeping? I'm good, thanks, yeah. Well, I'm as good <laughs> as I can be. The biggest names in golf and Ireland's best golf podcast, Golf Weekly, now exclusively available on Patreon. Go to o otbsports.com forward slash golf weekly to sign up now. OTB AM with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. It's the best Scottish team I've ever gone up against uh, as a coach or, or a player. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're very well coached, they're very physical, and they've got some real X Factor players as well. Um, you know, it's Finn Russell to name one and, and Stuart Hogg just to name another. Um, so I think they're in a very, very good place and we're aware of the challenge. Uh, I think we've taken confidence from some of the things we've done in the last three games. Uh, we've probably been unlucky in some regards and we haven't helped ourselves in other regards. You know, uh, we've probably given sides a leg up when we played them at times and and that's not that's something we just can't do going forward in the next two weeks you, you know you have to be uh you have to be hard to beat you can't give things away to teams um and unfortunately we've done that a little bit and in the next two weeks uh that's probably one of the most important parts of of what we have to deliver you know we have to be hard to beat we can't give things away we can't give teams a leg up um, because this Scottish team will take advantage of that. Yeah, it's Paul O'Connell setting a worried tone, a cautious tone ahead of Ireland against Scotland. We'll speak with Rory Lawson in just a minute. A reminder, OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Here's what's on otbsports.com on our uh, homepage. Uh, Filippo Giovagnoli, uh, not in a wink titles in League of Ireland. Uh, amateur jockey Rob James to face IHRB panel over dead horse video. Bohemians give formal recognition to Club Disability Supporters Association. 
and why the Irish school system is failing girls in sport. That's from uh, last night's OTB. We'll talk about that a little bit later on on the show as well. Uh, again, if you want to get in touch, 0879-180-180 is the number. A quick look through some of the headlines. Uh, Euro Dreams won't sidetrack Larkham. So Chris Larkham out doing media yesterday. That's the headline. And the examiner, McCarthy mulls over next move with ban appeal failed. So Ronan McCarthy, the Cork manager, has launched a personal appeal against the ban. This is after the Cork footballers were found and videoed training on Yall Beach in early January. Uh, you might have seen them wriggling around in the sand. This was during the winter shutdown. Uh, it wasn't a good look then. And I don't know, I mean, you kind of have to punish this, right? Because otherwise everybody would be at it. Um, the back page of The Guardian, that's a picture of Haaland. It's the same picture that the Herald used as well. Uh, with, like, really, he does not look human. <laughs> he looks like some kind of superhero. Uh, after the goals that he scored last night, um, it's becoming predictable the amount of goals that he's scoring at this stage. I'm staying is the headline there about Jurgen Klopp as well. And then that's, a, that's the picture that I was looking for a little bit earlier on. It's that moment of reckoning between Ronaldo and Chesney. Chesney's kind of smiling at him, going, oh, don't worry, don't worry. It's definitely your fault. Definitely, definitely, 100% your fault. Nothing to do with me in the goals. Your fault. And Ronaldo looks a little bit sickened, you know? Maybe you could have saved it, Boychek. Maybe we'd still be in the Champions League. Because really, that's, it's, it's this stage of the tournament that Ronaldo comes alive, as we all know. Uh, confusion, as some dogs said, Giovanni will not pick team because obviously um, Shane Keegan is the, the most qualified uh, coach and his title is manager, so he'll get to pick the team. Um, the back page of the mail, great Scots. O'Connell hails best Scotland side for years. That is the um, word in the Irish camp. They're not getting sucked into the, this is a terrible team. The Times, the London Times, Klopp, I'm staying until 2024. He said he had a contract of 2024. Didn't actually say he's going to stay until then. England agree equal pay split. So the England captain, Owen Farrell, will be paid the same during the Six Nations as Paolo Odogu, the uncapped WASP centre, after senior players voted to restructure the pay deal so that all squad members receive an equal share of a 2.1 million sterling pot. The uh, mirror, 999. Klopp will not answer Germany's emergency call to replace Lowe and tells fans, I'm still your man. Uh, and they also have um, a story about football's treatment of concussion being a shambles. Uh, that's the crack with the mirror. It's the same. Bye bye, says the son. Bye, BUI. Bruno won't pen deal without spending plan. And bye, Cavani is going to walk away after the race storm. That's why he's unhappy in England. Right, let's move on. Let's go back to the uh, rugby. And I'm delighted to say Rory Lawson is with us this morning. Rory, good morning to you. How are you? Yeah, good morning. Yeah, I'm, I'm really well, thank you. Excited we for a, a week of action, hopefully, having been starved of it from a Scottish perspective for, what, three weeks now. So, yeah, very much uh, looking forward to the weekend. We're all a little bit nervous here because normally we get excited when the Scotland game is coming up. It's, we chalk it in as a W at the start of the year. This year, we don't really feel so confident, I've got to tell you. Yeah, look, and I think probably justifiably so. I think um, certainly all the messages out of the Irish camp are very different to what the, the ex-players and pundits and coaches have sort of spoken about the Scotland squad previously. And I had a chat yesterday with, with Rory Best, and there's I, I don't think there's any coincidence, actually, that both he and Paul O'Connell are talking about the Scotland side being the, the toughest challenge that Ireland have faced for some time and the coincidence of both of them being front five forwards. Because I think, historically, Ireland looked to attack Scotland in the front five beat them up a little bit, find their edge, and then benefit off the back of it. But I think it's a hardier Scottish front five. I think it's a, a side that shows their attacking abilities um, more this year than they did last year. Um, and they've also got a, a significantly better defence than they, than they did in 2019 and even when the, the sides last met in early 2020. So I think that it's a, it's a different challenge for, for Ireland uh, coming up against the Scotland side. But I think they're they might still just edge the favourites tag for me. Where has the improvement from Scotland come from? Multiple areas, I think. Um, I actually think Stuart Hogg's done a great job taking over the leadership, and I think he's really started to grow in that role and understand how he can be at his most effective. Um, but I think it, you know, the, the big thing for me that the game starts in that front five, so set piece, scrum and maul, and I think Scotland historically have just been edged by Ireland in that area. And if you're five, 10% off in that co contest, 
then you're likely to be on the wrong end of the penalty count. You're likely to concede a few tries in and around malls um, when when the opposition get into the 22. And I think Rory Sutherland across the past couple of years since returning from a horrific injury has been absolutely outstanding. I think George Turner stepped up in hooker in the absence of Fraser Brown and Stuart McAnally. Xander Fagerson, barring the red card, I think is is starting to come of age and, and show his uh, maturity within, still in his, his fairly youthful years um, in the tight head jersey. And I think Johnny Gray's game has come on to a new level alongside Scott Cummings, who just continues to get better and better. So I think that's the, the starting point is the front five. Um, but there's no doubt at all that Scotland have found a, an attacking flow with Finn Russell back um, in the conductor's chair in the number 10 jersey. And, and from that, I think uh, Scotland's attack has got better. And under Steve Tandy, the defence has got better with the likes of defensive leaders, Chris Harris in the 13 jersey, who is getting better and better in the Scotland jersey. And I think the return this weekend of, of Jamie Ritchie will be an important one for Scotland as well. So I think it's all just about these small incremental improvements that that all add up to, to improve the overall team performance or I guess the the danger that the team can pose with and without the ball. There did seem to be a few moments over the last few years, Rory, where Gregor Townsend was open to a lot of criticism from Scottish rugby fans. There were a couple of bad defeats. I'm not sure if he was under any real pressure, but are you happy that patience has come to the fore and he is still around and, and still doing a good job? I think it, it's the nature of sport that, you know, results dictate how you're measured. And I think um, I think sometimes the long game is is worth playing. And I think with Gregor, you know, 2019, when Scotland were looking to play the fastest brand of rugby in the world and then went to the Rugby World Cup and, you know, got battered by Ireland physically in that opening game and then couldn't really recover from that. Um, I think that was a huge lear learning curve for Gregor as a, as a head coach. And he's he tweaked his, his coaching team off the back of it. Steve Tandy came in and um, the 2020 mantra for Scotland is, is, is be harder to beat, be really tough, uh, really tough nut to crack. And I think Scotland did that. Their defence got better. It was the best defence civ record in the, in the Six Nations. Um, and they were significantly harder to break down. But that was at the expense of the attacking game. 2021 so far has shown a decent balance between the two, albeit, you know, that game against Wales was definitely one that got away. But I think they're now finding the balance um, between when uh, when to be pragmatic, when to keep the ball in hand and, and be ambitious, and all built upon a, a stronger set piece that I spoke about and a, a defensive line that looks more solid than it has done for a for a long time and is is tougher to break down so we'll see more at the weekend they've had three weeks to stew on that loss against wales and um it's it'll have been a hugely frustrating time but i expect them to to come out with massive energy and intent on on sunday afternoon no fear of rustiness because of the three weeks off and obviously a lot of players will have got some some time with their clubs but is there is there like a you know what the intensity of these campaigns is like. Do they actually? Is it is it better to be rolling week to week, or is it actually not bad to have a couple of weeks off to you know, get into the classroom, do some study, do some video analysis, have those conversations, try and fix the things? I I think the players would have been desperate off the back of the Wales game to to you know to just take that that one rest week and get back into action. Um, it will have huge been hugely frustrating. And there's always there's always a fear of like having to nudge a bit of the rust away from three weeks without action for for the bones of the squad uh don't get me wrong you know the likes of Stuart Hogg played for Exeter at the weekend and um but on the whole the squad will return fresh and because it's a Sunday game you've got that extra day to recover anyway so um for those guys that have played but I think Scotland now look more comfortable within what they're trying to do they look much clearer with regards to their strategy and um, how they how they they're looking to attack first phase and then multi phase off the back of it, their kicking game um, looks like it has more purpose and that's such a huge part of the game now. Um, but there's no doubt at all they'll be desperate to have a really strong opening quarter at home against Ireland in because this game is bigger than just 
Sunday's result for me. This is the opportunity to to lay down a statement. I think for both sides, it really is. Um, it will go a long way to defining their Six Nations. You know, if Ireland don't win this and they're 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 one win from four, then you know they're staring down the barrel of a best case scenario fourth place finish. If they win, then they're looking at a comfortable top half finish. Um, and it's and it's very similar for Scotland. They're you know one from two at the moment. Um, but if they if they manage to pick up a win on Sunday, back that up with a win against Italy um, the following week, uh, back at BT Murrayfield, and then then you go to Paris potentially with the chance at going for a title shot. So it's a huge afternoon on Sunday, and that's even without talking about the relatively few occasions whereby Scotland are going to have the opportunity to match themselves against Ireland before the Rugby World Cup, and I think psychologically that is also an important factor. We're kind of sick of playing Scotland in the Rugby World Cup, I've got to tell you. <laughs> uh, I, I'm with you. I'm with you on that one. <laughs> Especially because I, 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 heading up to the, the game in the last Rugby World Cup, I thought, ooh, Scotland have really improved. All the stuff that you talked about, the tight five improving, the defence structure, the attacking game plan, we literally expected that to manifest itself in in Japan and there was just no sign of it. Now there was a few bounces of a ball here and there. I think ultimately, you know, in retrospect, the score definitely flattered Ireland, particularly the way we played in the rest of the tournament. But um, I, I guess the, the point I'm trying to make here is that Scotland are a couple of years behind where we thought they would be, but they're finally coming good. Yeah, and look, look, I think it's, this is, for, for me, this championship was about five, trying to string together five performances or as close to five performances as possible to be able to actually measure where are, where are Scotland at the moment? Because we've, we, we've all seen, you know, great Scotland wins in, you know, the past few years, but not consistently. And I think this is, for this crop of players, which is the best Scotland squad for 20 years, um, I, I think it, the, the results are and performances that lead to those results um, are really important. And I think, you know, the World Cup was undoubtedly a massive slap in the chops for for Scotland. Went in with really high hopes, um, and ultimately crashed out the crashed out in the group stages. Um, I think that Ireland game set the tone, and it's it was difficult, really difficult for Scotland to be able to reel things back in. When I look back to that, I, I think there was, I was out at the Rugby World Cup, and I thought at the time there was a, a huge element of tactical naivety um, when you took into consideration the. The opposition, more importantly, probably the conditions, um, they just weren't suited to the style of play that Scotland set out to play, um, whereby you're playing in humid conditions, a sweaty ball, um, really difficult handling conditions, and yet Scotland tried doing so from inside their own half, almost fueled by, you know, the successes of a win against England at Murrayfield, flinging the ball around willy-nilly, um, and, and, and the pass is sticking, but... When it came to it, Ireland squeezed them, just throttled the life out of them um, and broke down the defence all too easily to, to register a comfortable win. I think this Scotland side now, um, I believe, is starting to come of age, show signs of coming of age. Um, but the results and building the momentum through this, the next three games is going to go a, hu a huge uh, way to... The, how, how the public, how the media like ourselves, um, how, how people within the, their, their opponents start looking at Scotland because all too often, and Ireland being a prime example, um, Scotland have rolled over all too easy. When you, if, you, if you match them and, and, and knock them over up front and give it to them rough, then they'll, they'll, they'll go away eventually. But I think there's a bit more steel within the Scotland side now. This is something that was picked up on last year after the Nations Cup game between the sides. Eddie O'Sullivan was on television duty and Stuart Hogg had just given a TV interview saying we're onto something special here, despite the fact that Ireland had beaten them again. And uh, Eddie didn't take too kindly to this. He says they've all, always talked themselves up. They always talk a great game. They have some deluded notion that they are better than they are. Uh, these guys haven't won here in 10 years, he said. It's just deluded. They talk themselves up. They come in and then they implode. Does something like that get under the skin of Scotland? Does it register in Scotland at all? It registered with me. Um, you know, I, I, it's, it, it's gr head, headline grabbing stuff. 
isn't it? And it does it does frustrate me. It, what what you do realize though, if and that's it frustrates me because that that isn't the view of the players within that Ireland squad. And I think that's that's something that is is very clear. Ireland, you know, speaking to Bestie yesterday about it, I, when Ireland prepared to play against Scotland now, they know that, that they need to be they need to have an edge to them. They need to be ready for it, take nothing for granted, because it's a game that they expect to win, but it's a game that they have to give the proper respect to. I think um, Eddie O'Sullivan's comments frustrated me, um, being someone outside of the squad. And I did think to myself this week, because they, they still ring a little bit in my ears when I, when I think about playing against Ireland, um, that it would, if I was coaching Scotland, if I was in Gregor Townsend's shoes or one of his assistants, would I use that as ammo coming into this game? I'm not sure I would because I think it's a misrepresentation of the the team and the views of the side and coaching team that they're coming up against. But you know, it certainly grabbed a few headlines. Um, easy for him to say on the touchline um, as somebody who isn't involved in the game out, with, outside of talking about it. But um, yeah, you know, it certainly grabbed the attention of many. And he's not been alone in that. You know, I remember Ronan O'Gara saying similar probably four years ago, maybe. Um, and it's it's justifiable because when you take into account the the records between the two sides after you know Scotland had dominance for a decade coming into this millennium, um, but since then Ireland have had the upper hand. Scotland have only finished above Ireland once in the twenty one previous Six Nations in the table, albeit they've won games. Um, so you know it's it's, it's about time that Scotland uh, turned the tide and and shifted the dial a little bit on that. I think the Ronan O'Gara comment was, I hope we hammer them. They're too mouthy, but they can't back it up. And that was right before the 2017 game, which it was like, in fairness, if you're going to be uh, an Irish pundit, there, there are a multitude of times you could have said that and been sitting there smug afterwards. Uh, he just got that a little bit wrong because 17 is when, obviously, the Ireland bus gets delayed and Murray Field is just this uh, hellhole for Ireland on that occasion. Yeah. Yeah, and look, it's... um. It's, it's one of it's one of the great debates. Uh, something that I do I do a bit bit of work in with some guys is you know how how much do you allow the external noise of the media of social media um, to impact your week you know positively or negatively going into a game because the reality is is that it is there it is it is there for you to consume and I I played alongside plenty of blokes who went to the newspaper or onto social media after they had had a great game and wanted to read about all the positive stuff that everybody was saying about them. But then they weren't happy when the journalists or, you know, keyboard warriors started talking them down when they had a poor game. Um, and I know a number of guys distance themselves from it now. I think it's important to be able to have control over that with however you use it. Because, you know, sometimes people do need to be told what a great job they're doing from external sources but equally you need to be able to to take it from elsewhere but how you manage that noise that's coming externally is a hugely important part of the game you know i've spoken to world-class players british and irish lions who have historically the first thing they've done when they've gone into the changing room afterwards is gone onto twitter to see what people are saying and that's not healthy but um you know i, th I think for me the you can still you can use that external noise if you if you are if you understand how to how to manage it but it's, it's easier said than done because there are plenty of people the world over in and out of sport and you know in politics and current affairs um who are very very happy to tell you that they do a better job um from the, from the sidelines with a pint in hand yeah that's really interesting because it's, you you play with fire a little bit if you try and manage it if you're like if you, if you make that decision, oh, I'm, I'm going to try and use the bad stuff as fuel and I'm going to use the good stuff as fuel, it's very hard because human beings, while we like to think we have thick skins, ultimately we don't. We're very fragile. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, I, I worked with a guy, um, or I, uh, there's a pal of mine who worked with some guys, and I won't, I won't say anybody, uh, who, any names, but there was uh, an individual within a Six Nations team. And this guy told me a story about how he had gone in to, to talk to the, the, the team about the management of themselves around social media. 
um, how it could impact performance, how it can essentially, we all know it can fritter away time to a horrendous extent. Um, if, you know, just flicking up, up through your screen on whatever it might be, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, I don't even know. Um, but I've been guilty of it previously, but there was a guy, and again, this is, this is a different story and a different British and Irish lion, but he was really affected by some negative comments. And there was a particular troll who went after him, you know, win, lose or draw, he would go after him hard because he didn't think that he should be in this site. And the consultant mate, pal of mine did, uh, managed to track, track down the IP address, wherever he was sending these from and had a brought up, brought up a sort of picture of where this guy was and, um, and cause he was, he was hidden behind, uh, whatever picture he had wasn't, wasn't actually of him. And this, the, the player was being rocked by the, the sort of tweets that were being sent to him by this bloke. And he said, you're allowing this bloke who lives wherever he lives. And he was able to show him in this house, you're allowing him to dictate your performance on the international scene, your mindset, when you're off field, you know, thinking about training, thinking about your own performance, managing yourself in preparation for a game. You're allowing that troll who's sat behind his keyboard in his underpants, eating, eating a pie and drinking a pint to impact on your week. Um, and I think it really struck the guy and, and started opening up his mind because you can get caught in this bubble whereby there's so much noise that you just can't filter it. Um, and it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's so easy to say, if you can manage it, great. Um, but it's also, you know, there are very, very few guys who don't engage with social media at all. Yeah. Um, because it's it, the nature now with regards to, you know, whether it's off field commercial opportunities or engagement with fans, because at the end of the day, it's a great platform to be able to engage with fans, engage with charities, engage with potential partners, people who you might be able to do work experience for or, or you know look at for career advice there's so much good to come out of it but sadly there are, there is also an awful lot of negative noise that is difficult to cut through rory there was one last thing that i wanted to ask you about um your bill mclaren's grandson is that correct yeah that's correct yeah ah, look we had him in studio when he was doing his book um and it was supposed to be a 12 to 15 minute interview but he ended up spending 50 minutes with us and uh, I found the tapes again recently and it's just amazing. It was like an incredible privilege to spend time talking to him about being a spotter in the army in the war. I can only imagine what it must have been like growing up listening to that voice and now what it must be like when they show the old films and the defining thing of, of the era is actually the quality and the timbre of the voice. Yeah, look, I, um, I, I'd love to. I'd love to hear that interview um, because it's it's something whereby I, I think he was so well known for being behind the microphone when live action was in play, um, but he very rarely did things like that. Um, so I'd, I'd love to hear that interview. He was, you know, I, I I'm short of superlatives every time that I'm asked about him. Uh, this is one of his big sheets on the wall behind me. His preparation notes from. Um, for, for, for every commentary that he did, uh, which was phenomenal. Um, I think, you know, the, the big thing that he, he summed up was just the, the preparation that he put into everything, the respect that he gave the game and the, the viewers of the game and the players of the game to get himself absolutely right. Um, and I saw it firsthand. I saw him put in 40 hour working weeks to prepare for a, for a commentary, which bear in mind, for the biggest chunk of his his 50 year career he had without the internet without google without any club website or international website without that player data or apps that we that we can now you know we now take for granted he was working out of rugby annuals or calling up the team manager to find out some information about in the amateur era what people are doing for jobs and you know what what their parents have done and you know how many kids they have and what they had for their breakfast and all that kind of stuff. And um, the, the detail that he went into, the desire to do the best job he could to engage people, entertain people and inform people ultimately was, 
you know, beyond any anything um, that I, I had ever seen before. And I, I didn't really understand him, but it set the platform for him to go out and do what he did because his, you know, his voice was incredible. His turn of phrase was incredible. We had it when we were, you know, when we were the grandkids um, charging around in the park in Hoyk. You know, he's he was a PE teacher. He loved sport. Um, he had a passion and energy for life and no matter what the sport was, he loved it. And that's definitely carried into me and others within, you know, others throughout the family. Um, my mum, you know, my mum could sit in a rugby studio and give better insight than half the pundits who, who do it because she is so knowledgeable about rugby, having grown up around them and had a passion for it. And obviously my dad, you know, my dad played for Scotland as well. And, you know, listening to Papa commentate on my dad scoring two tries for Scotland against England in 1976 still makes the hairs on the, the back of my neck stand up. And um, he was, he was a phenomenon and I am, um, I am, I'm, I'm due him an awful lot because um, I could still probably go into the majority of rugby pubs in the world and have someone buy me a pint uh, just by mentioning his name. Such was the impact that he had around the world. So um, he was a very, very special commentator and broadcaster, but he was above that. He was a, you know, such an incredible, heroic man. Um, and just somebody who I strive to just be a little bit like in the way that I show up on a day to day basis. Well, it's a great lesson to learn. I'll send you the MP3 and we'll, we'll republish it. Actually, that's a great idea. But um, uh, Rory, you've been great with your time. That's a, an, an amazing testimony you've just paid to your grandfather. I hope you enjoy the game, but not too much this weekend. <laughs> Yeah, well, look, I was um, I was one of I think eleven or twelve Scots to experience the the first Scotland win at Twickenham in thirty eight years. So I, every time that I I get the opportunity to broadcast on these games at the moment without crowds, I feel even more privileged than normal. So, um, but I will I will certainly be hoping to um, to see a Scotland win, albeit with my neutral co commentator's hat on on Sunday afternoon. Good stuff. Great to talk to you. Thanks a million. Cheers. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Rory Lawson there, uh, really interesting stuff and that revolution that's happening in, in Scottish rugby, oh and it unfortunately looks like it's going to peak at just the right time for them around the Rugby World Cup and maybe we won't even make it out of the group states, we didn't even bother worrying about making the quarterfinals. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Paul O'Connell is uh, flamossing anybody by suggesting that this is the best Scotland team he's come up against and he includes his playing career, he includes his coaching career when he talks about all of that, so they're bloody good, they've started the Six Nations so well it was a very Scottish thing for them to catch the unfortunate break a couple of weeks ago that you feel that they would have given France a real game uh, in that. It would have been a cracking game of rugby. I think everybody was really looking forward to that. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, if it's a cracking game of rugby this weekend, you feel that Scotland might edge it. They're maybe a little bit further ahead of Ireland when it comes to, to their attacking game. But who knows? Like, I mean, there is a form and, I guess, a history of results against a nation does count when it comes to these sort of things. Uh, MOC on YouTube says Scotland let their players play for clubs outside Scotland and play for their country to go to the next level. Ireland should do the same. It's not quite an easy equivalent, but, you know, there's definitely merit in us having a conversation around this. Couldn't we at least talk about it? Couldn't you just at least remind us all about why those rules are so... Like, what's going to happen in the back row? We're going to have eight or nine back rowers who are on the bench all the time, but who could well be international class and they weren't getting the opportunity to prove it. Uh, Mr Smith 434 says, Scotland are entitled to beat us once every four years. I think this could be it and I won't be annoyed if we do lose. That's the spirit. That's, that's definitely the, the winning mentality that uh, Andy Farrell wants from his player. Ah, sure, look, they're entitled to beat us once every four years. This is it. <laughs> and look, do you know what? If they beat us here and they don't beat us in the World Cup and we qualify from that group, we'll all be happy. What are we at? 8.44 this morning. Time for Virtual Insanity. John Duggan is with us. John, good morning to you. Jaron Owen, how are we getting on? How did Virtual Insanity go last week? John, take your victory lap. Christian Bozuede and Houts, 70 to 1 recommendation each way, finished 7th. So in the last four weeks, we had Maverick McNeely second at 80 to 1, Tony Fina second at 25 to 1, Raphael Campos third at 175 to 1, and Christian Bozuede and Houts. 7th at 70 to 1. So no winners, but as somebody said to me on Twitter, you're scoring lots of points. The goals will come. Uh, that's all profit though, right? All profit, yeah. So back in profit slightly on the year without any winners tips. So it's a strange situation. But it's all about each way because uh, for Bezuid and Out, it's 14 to 1 
uh, for him to finish in the top eight. Obviously, there was there was players there that I tipped. I tipped generally four to five each week. Like Fitzpatrick was tied for tenth at the headline tip. But yeah, yeah, I'm seeing things clearly, lads. I had a question, right? And uh, I was told it was a bit a bit silly. Um, but it does it matter if he finishes second or eighth? Doesn't matter. Right. Doesn't matter. So scrape it in there because yeah. your boy had a double bogey on, on 18. I know, like... yeah. It was uh, it was it punched the wall time. Um the hand has recovered. Uh but yeah, it was it was it was just, I thought he was it was gonna be out of the money, and that's that's golf and that's those that's the risk and reward of these like really uh, fascinating courses like uh, Sawgrass and Bay Hill, which we saw last week. So yeah, everybody collapsed really around 17 and 18. So it can go very, very badly wrong if you have water on a course. Yeah. Okay, so what this week, what have we got? The Players' Championship. Are we starting yeah. with Roy McIlroy and his recent collapse? Like, at the start of the American season, McIlroy played really well. And I was like, oh, this is going to be great. We actually, he's going to be relevant again. And then since then, it's kind of been a great Thursday golfer. Uh, a reasonable Saturday golfer sometimes, just not very good on the Sundays when he's needed to be. False sense of security is what we're all being lulled into with Rory McIlroy at the moment. Look, at seven years without a major, and uh, he was uh, now uh, outside the world's top 10, 11th in the world, hasn't won in 16 months, uh, and is uh, unhappy with certain aspects of his game. He hasn't figured out aspects of his irons and his swing at the moment. So he's hit the ball very well. We all know that he's a streaky putter, but generally the only weakness in his game is his putting, and that could be in and out. But generally his long game is very good. But at the moment there's issues around his wedge play and his iron play and his play in the par threes. Um, and he was asked yesterday, because of this drought in the majors and the fact that he's in his 30s now, if his best days are behind him, and he doesn't agree. You have to be an eternal optimist in this game, and I truly believe that my best days are ahead of me. And you have to believe that. You can't, you know, if there's no point in me being out here if I didn't think that. You know, that's just not, that's just not part of my psyche or anyone's psyche out here. I think that's the difference between people that make it to the elite level and the people that don't, because they don't think that way. Um, there was a quote last week that uh, I don't know what the word is or how to describe it, which is a little dejected, maybe looking to go in a different direction. I don't know. I need something. I need a spark. I need something. I just don't seem to have it. Some days it's good. Some days it's not. He said, it's not Michael Bannon as coach. It's not Harry Diamond as caddy. He feels it's a swing, which he hasn't figured out. A lot of the time with Rory McIlroy, I think sometimes it can be mental, mental, uh, getting in the way of himself. We saw that so uh, starkly at Port Rush a couple of years ago. And he, I think he needs to play with a bit more freedom and a bit more of that easygoing style, which we saw earlier in his career, which uh, brought him such success. Yeah. Are you tipping him this week? No. <laughs> and I'm not tipping Ram, I'm not tipping DJ, I'm not tipping Xander, I'm not tipping Justin Thomas. Uh, Shane Larry, just to give you an Irish uh, uh, summary, uh, tied 11th in Houston, but he's only made two top 10 finishes since the Open win, missed the cut last week, he's really out of form, he's 200 to 1. Uh, Gray McDowell, five missed cuts and seven starts, but it's a great tournament, guys. We all know if you even played uh, golf in the Tiger Woods game, what the sawgrass is like. You've got those island green, the 17th, there's risk and reward, it's very, very dramatic. You'll have a bit of fans there. It was great to see some fans there last week. You could really tell the mashed potato brigade were back. Um, but this is what we're going to do, okay, for virtual insanity. 11.30, it starts tomorrow, Irish time. Bet responsibly, you never gamble more than you can afford. Obviously, this is a bit of a bit of a challenge, a bit of a puzzle to try and predict who's going to win. Shop around. Some bookmakers offering great terms, up to 10 places uh, for a fifth of the odds, and some then bookmakers offering... Um, excuse me just for a second there, uh, offering eight or nine places, but maybe with more generous odds. Look, I feel very strongly about the headline tip this week. It is Patrick Cantlay, the American. He's 20 to one for four each way. Patrick Cantlay, no weaknesses in his game. A second in the FedEx Cup standings, won the Zozo Championship back in October, faced down John Ram, and he faced down Justin Thomas then. Played really well on the West Coast, is right up at the stats in terms of stroke gains. Um, has had like very, very few poor performances for quite a long time now. Patrick Cantley likes Sawgrass, likes the challenge that it poses, has had good finishes there. Uh, more so, they tailed off, but he had been uh, fifth and second at halfway to two of the occasions, but he's a completely different animal now. He's unassuming, he's got a quiet style, and he's not the most flashy golfer, but he's in the side of the top 10 in the world rankings at ninth. But I think Patrick Cantley is an underrated golfer still in people's conversations and people's, in in people's thoughts. I think Patrick Cantlay, for me, is absolutely 
a really, really strong uh, uh, tip for me this week at 20 to 1 each way. Um, the other ones, Hideki Matsuyama, 30 to 1 for two each way, shot a 63 in this ill fated tournament last year before the whole pandemic. Uh, uh, on, on the onset of that, uh, stop the whole tournament. But uh, Hideki Matsuyama inside the top 25, five times from six starts, twice inside the top 10 at Sawgrass, loves the course, has been hovering around um, inside the top 20 in his last two events, Hideki Matsuyama. So I think if he's going to get back into the top echelon, this could be the week. The third selection, Scotty Scheffler, two each way, 45 to one, um, seven times in the top 10 last season, rookie of the year, top fives of the PGA and the Tour Championship. Fifth last time out of the concession, so he's obviously in form, hits it a mile, makes a lot of birdies. Scotty Scheffler, the American. Fourth tip, Will Zalatoris for a Euro each way is 70 to 1. This guy um, is always around the leaderboard at the moment. He's already uh, secured his tour card. Um, nine times he's been in the top 25 in his last 12 starts and played well at Bell Bay Hill last week with a tied for 10th. A good iron player, Will Zalatoris, one of these young guns, a 70 to 1 to be on the top uh, page of the leaderboard again. And the rank outsider, there has to be one of these every week. Jonathan Vegas spells his name very strangely, but then again, he's probably the way they, they spell the, the, the name in, in Venezuela, just a bit of a different spelling. Uh, 200 to 1. Uh, tied for third in 2019 behind Rory at Sawgrass, was second in his last tournament in Puerto Rico. Uh, back into form, Jonathan Vegas, who's won the Canadian Open twice. So at 200 to 1, he's 40 to 1 to finish in the top 10. That might not be a bad outsider. So Vegas, Scheffler, Zalatoris, Matsuyama. But guys, I really have put my money where my mouth is this week. I really do fancy Patrick Cante each way. I, I, can't, I can't say any more than that. What, what is it that makes you look at Cantlay this week as opposed to some other weeks? What is it about, the, like, are you looking for track form or specific moment form? What is it? He's been playing so well. Like he absolutely murdered that American Express course on the West Coast and finished second. Then he shot a 62 at Pebble Beach. Uh, then he was tied 15th at the Genesis at Riviera. He actually pulled out of the tournament a couple of weeks ago for dehydration and stomach issues. I'm hoping that won't be a, a thing. I actually think he probably needed the break. Um, this guy was the top amateur in the world. He had really bad back problems, and then he lost his best friend in a, in a car accident. So he had a few years out of it. But this was one of the top players, Walker Cup player, and his rate of progression, he won Jack's tournament at the Memorial with a 64. To me, he is. this guy could be the world number one quite soon. Um, I remember the way he went around the Masters a couple of years ago, when Tiger won the Masters. He shot like in two rounds in the 60s. He absolutely blitzed Augusta for two rounds. And that's the way he plays. And he's spoken about how much he loves Sawgrass. And on those two occasions that he played there, 17 and 18, he wasn't probably ready for prime time, but he was in the top five at halfway both times. I just think he has the no-nonsense game to compete at Sawgrass this week. And for me, he's really hitting the ball well. He's putting well. I think he's a really good each-way bet when I definitely have question marks so of some of the other contenders. Bryson can't bludgeon his way around Sawgrass. Uh, Justin Thomas has probably hasn't recovered from that controversial incident at the start of the year. DJ's driver hasn't been uh, completely behaving itself. Uh, Ram hasn't been putting too well. Uh, Marikawa might not have enough experience of the course. To me, this is clear. Okay, that's interesting. You, I didn't realize that you also look for weaknesses uh, in the opponents as well. When you're making yeah. up those selections. And one last thing about the rank outsiders. What it's it's track form essentially around this track in previous years and a little bit of current form. Yeah, they're the two things generally I'm looking for. Um when I wasn't tipping that well, say October, November, Brian Gay played well in Bermuda and he came out and he won. He was third the year before and he came out and he won. Uh and then Robert Streb had won a tournament five years ago, came back and won that same tournament. They're both two, 300, 400 one shots. And I do think you need to have, if a player likes the course, they, they've, had, they've had good memories there and they can contend. And, and recent form is the key. I think recent form is generally more important than course form, but both uh, attributes are important, but also that having that bottle to win. And Patrick Cantlay has shown that bottle at Jack's tournament and at the Zozo. You might have a player that is in recent form and has got course form, but can't finish the deal. Um, and that's why Sergio Garcia was a fatty of a tip of mine for many, many years. So <laughs> you, also want to, you also want to back uh, people that have the bottle. And that's why I'm like Scheffler and Zalatoris, because these are two guys, young up and comers, their rate of progression is, is really, really high. And you gotta have them on side. There's just well, just as much as you want to have Ram on side for the majors and Cantlay on side for the majors. And that's why if you're back in Rory McIlroy for the last 16 months, how many tournaments is that? What, 30 tournaments? 
you're losing a lot of money at eight, nine, tenths of one a tournament. Yeah, yeah, and that's the other thing. They, you you got to work out that um, on those each way bets when they come in each way, you lose the win stake part of your bet, yeah. and so uh, while it's a fifth of the odds, it's actually a little bit less than that in the end. Uh, but yeah. all told, from 2021's perspective, we're slightly in profit. Slightly in profit. I've spent a thousand euro. I, I started off with a thousand euro virtually. I have a thousand and four. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, Without know. a winner, but with four with four second places, if two of those have won, it'd be a healthy profit. Yeah. And look, it's all look with any business, Jar, as you know, it's all about profit and loss. A hundred percent. John, good stuff. Thanks very much for that. All right, guys. John Douglas, Cheers. Virtual Insanity. It's with us every Wednesday morning here on OTBAM, and obviously we'll talk about it, keep an eye on those golfers over the course of the rest of the week as well. If you want to get in touch with us this morning, 87 9180180 is this number to uh, get in touch with us. And you can also, of course, uh, leave a comment on the YouTube stream for us. We'd love to hear from you about who should be starting at nine for Ireland. I mean, I think it's all nailed on that Johnny Sexton's going to start at 10, and that's going to be the case until, really, until potentially Joey Carberry makes it back to the point where he is uh, able to actually uh, displace him. Um, uh, that, that whole issue about whether or not um, Carberry starts for Munster is something that we should talk about uh, again on the show when we get a chance to um, in the coming days and weeks. One thing as well, we're going to talk about Liverpool. Simon Hughes of The Athletic is going to join us uh, about ten past five past nine and we'll talk about the uh, Champions League game and obviously the situation with regards to Klopp. But what the hell has gone wrong at Liverpool? Because it can't just be Virgil van Dijk's injury. So if you've got theories on that, we'd love to hear from you as well. 0879-180-180 is the uh, WhatsApp number, and you can uh, get us on that. Um, as a Munster fan, Owen, do you want Joey Carberry to start straight away, or do you want them to ease him back in? I want him to start the Pro 14 final. So it's a couple of weeks to actually build up a few more minutes, and I guess starting him straight away in the games between now and the Pro 14 final is probably what's going to need to happen if he's going to start that final. I think it's an important game. I think it's the most important game. I think it's going to be a, a, a tricky path to actually winning the Champions Cup, so maybe prioritising that. Uh, that you, you think that winning that trophy would actually be, in the long run, more important? The, the bit of silverware, the getting one over on Leinster, establishing parity of esteem? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, like, I mean, there, there's only so many... Like, OK, so what, what's the bigger signifier for progress for Munster? Is, is it getting to... A Champions Cup final. Uh, it was that bigger progress than actually winning the Pro 14. Maybe it is, but the context of winning the Pro 14 is beating Leinster, who are going to have a significant say in the Champions Cup. Beating Leinster might have a knock-on impact going into next season. Like, like it or not, they are always going to be there when it comes to the story of Munster over the next few years, what Leinster are doing. And it's just really important that in a really meaningful game, Munster get one over on them. If they could do both, that would be fantastic, and they do have the depth to battle on both fronts over the course of two weeks. My only concern is that Munster are obviously going to need their test players to be playing in both of those games, if they're going to win both of those games. And those test players are likely to have played against England in the previous week. So it's going to be three weeks in a row if you want to have it all as a Munster fan. And I, I just wonder, is that too much to ask for? And it would be a little bit different if you looked at the Leinster performance at the weekend and thought that, all right, there's a, a lot of holes to be picked at here. Whereas with Leinster was kind of rootless and totally brutal, even though they were missing, obviously, most of their um, test players and, and their Ireland frontliners. So that drop-off isn't just about the quality, it's about the experience that 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 um, that the second-string teams ha now have. And if Leinster needs to make changes, if they need to play a half-team, it's still going to be unbelievably strong. And Leinster must be looking at trying to do the double. At, I mean, look, of course they are. That's the that's the quality and depth that they have. Um, just to go back to Munster, though, for like, there's a there's a short term and there's a medium term. I I don't feel like Van Gran is under that much pressure in terms of potentially losing his job if things don't go well over the next three or four weeks, right? I think that everybody appreciates that Simon got injured and they haven't had Carberry. So, like, your big signing in the second row who was going to drive that pack forward and, again, make sure that whatever game you were in, from a physical perspective, your team was not going to get bullied. Um, and that uh, Carberry, we think, is potentially the most gifted, talented player that we have when it comes to being a creative force uh, in, the, in the entire uh, four provinces. So, do you rush everybody back in the hope that you win something now? Or do you go, OK, all right, I, I see what you're doing. But we're absolutely, next year, when there are fans in Thomond, going to turn that into one of the hardest places to come 
in world rugby. Like, I guess what I'm saying is, do you, do you roll with Ben Healy now for the next few weeks and have Carby coming off the bench? Not a bad scenario. You're not risking anything. I mean, obviously, they're not risking anything. You're risking whatever the normal risks are, but you're not rushing Carberry back to get to a scenario where he doesn't have the games in his legs just yet. Yeah, and like what you probably need to remember as well that we're like two weeks out from Carberry needing to be ready for this. Uh, like, I mean, is that going to be enough time for him to get to somebody who plays 20 minutes to somebody who's actually going to be ready to start a game and actually play 70, for example? That could be a little bit of a stretch. I, I just think that if the Munster coaching staff are looking around the dressing room and see a Joy Carberry who can start and play over an hour of rugby, like, what, what is the point in waiting? Like, it, it, the, if you get to a point where this guy is ready to come on and actually get 20 minutes, then you're not overly afraid of re-aggravating whatever injury it is. So the question then is just building up the match fitness. Now, it's two weeks enough time to build up match fitness to go from impact sub to starter. I think so, because chances are Joey Carberry's coming off the pitch last weekend against Connacht saying, I've got a little bit more in the tank. He probably could have played a half of rugby if he wants to. Then they're still wrapping him in cotton wool a little bit. So I'd be confident that, that we will see him from the start either in the Pro 14 final or against Toulouse. And uh, like I, I think that maybe the former is the slightly more important fixture. But I'm sure there are people out there who will totally disagree with that and say it's all about Europe when it comes to Munster. All right. It's a minute past nine this morning. We'll uh, play that debate out over the uh, next few days and weeks, hopefully. Uh, now, every week this month here on Off the Ball, we're going to be joined by Fergus McNally as he attempts to quit smoking with the HSC Quit team. The HSC Quit service provides personalised free support by phone, email, text message and live chat. Smokers can call free 1-800-201-203 or visit quit.ie for stop smoking tips and resources. If you quit smoking for 28 days, you're five times more likely to quit for good. Fergus, good morning to you. How are you? I'm good and yourself? Yeah, good. How are you getting on? Yeah, I'm still off the cigarettes, so it's, it's four weeks now, so it's 28 days. So, as you said, I'm five times more likely to, to stay quit now. So... It's good. It's going well. Have you made the 28 days before? Yeah, I have done, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I would say, yeah, maybe twice, yeah. But I'm in a better frame of mind now to do it, you know. I'm in, I'm, I'm much better, more focused to do it, so. Yeah, I think uh, that, that, like, look, it's very difficult. Everybody's, um, everybody's journey is their own, as you know. Uh, we, yeah. wanted, we wanted to talk about cravings today, right? Um, like yeah. any former smoker understands that uh, it's a really weird thing to explain to people who, who didn't smoke, but that kind of immediate head rush that you get when you have your first cigarette. And, uh, it, you know, it's very alluring. Like that's the whole point of the thing. That's why people find it so bloody hard to give up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I don't crave that at the minute, you know what I mean? But I am craving other things, maybe to try and substitute that, you know? Um, I think to do that, to to smoke now at this stage, I'll have to go through so many processes. I'll have to go to the, cig to the shop, buy cigarettes where, the, where my cravings are more immediate, you know what I mean? So I just need to delay that. And there's a little sequence you go through, you delay it, you discuss it, you drink water. I've called the four Ds, so that's what I've been doing so far, just to nip those cravings in the bud, that they don't get to a stage that you will go and buy cigarettes, you know? What are the four Ds? Um, delay, distract, drink water, and discuss. Right. So you kind of, so say if I was sitting down and I said, oh, I need a cigarette, I'd get up and I'd go and fold some clothes or put something in the washing machine or empty the dishwasher, you know, that sort of thing, so that would delay that. You're distracting yourself as well, and um, you drink you drink some water. And then if it really got really bad, you'd probably discuss it with someone. There is a number there at the HSC of a free phone number that you can ring, and people will talk to you through it. You know. So you're telling me you've got the tidiest, cleanest house in the world at the moment. I wouldn't say that no, because <laughs> I'm not really that bad, you know. But I am. I might be distracted and do something differently. You know, I might not always tidy up. I might reach for a biscuit as well. So I need to keep my hand out of a cookie jar or a lap of hole different problem on my hands you know? I know yeah um, when I, I gave up smoking like a long time ago at this stage but it was in the middle of watching The Sopranos as well and I don't know if you've watched The Sopranos but there's a lot of food eating in that so I basically sat on the couch and ate instead of uh, going out and having cigarettes back in the day and it wasn't good for the waistline I'm going to tell you Fergus no no I actually watched Your Honour there recently and uh, that 
that was quite good. There was a lot of smoking in that, and I kind of kept thinking about going for a cigarette when they were smoking, you know? Yeah. But um, it, it's good to distract yourself with something like that, you know? Do you have to avoid, like, uh, any of this in pop culture? Do you have to avoid any of your mates who are smokers? No, because I don't know none of my mates are. So, um, and we're in the lockdown, so the only place I would meet them would be in the local club of a uh, Thursday night, and we, we, we can't do that. So, no. There's nobody smoking that I know. Right. Really. That's good, though, right? That, like, you're, I mean, I, I don't want to uh, overblow this, but you're kind of a pariah in your group if you smoke, and you need a little bit of that sometimes. Yeah, well, well actually, recently, and I don't know if it was a catalyst, but recently I was out, we, we live in a cul-de-sac, and there's quite a few young children, and I interact with them, you know, like they're friends of mine's daughters and sons, and one of them just said to me, why do you smoke? Like, and it was quite quite innocent. It was just a question, why do you smoke, you know? And I was the only one who did. I looked up and down the road, and I was the only one who did smoke on the road. So I could be the only person that she knows that smokes, you know? So I'm there. This is wrong, you know? This is, it's not the norm anymore, where it used to be the norm. What did you answer? I didn't really. I was a bit taken aback, and I just said, I, and I couldn't say because I like it or because it's cool. <laughs> Because it's not cool and I don't like it. But so I, I did. I don't think I had an answer for. Yeah. Well, it, it was one of the things that I keep thinking of in my head. Like, is, is Faye across the road asked me why do I smoke? I may not be able to answer. You know. Fergus, you've been involved in sports like I, I don't know, essentially all your life, right? Um, like um, ba back in the day, where there's very famous pictures of uh, in various GAA grounds around the country. I remember uh, it might have been the Westmead hurlers, one of the subs having a fag after he'd been taken off in a championship match against Kilkenny where they'd racked up like 424 and the, the Sunday game cameras cut to a guy <laughs> having a cigarette sitting on the top of the dugout. Was it, was it accepted or like it, it, you're young enough, I suspect, that um, maybe it was frowned upon for people to be having cigarettes on touchlines in, in dugouts at, at grounds. Yeah, the only person I ever saw do that was Billy Baxter. He was with Mullen, Mullen United, and he was a bit of a character, and he used to smoke Gaugelet, these French cigarettes. He was the only one I can remember smoking. That was in the very early days. That was maybe nearly 20 years ago. And no, um, no, he got away with it, all right. Nobody was like, here, listen, you can't be doing that, Billy. No, no, it was in the first division. I don't think there was many cameras around. <laughs> you didn't have to watch the LOI going on then that they've just launched, you know, so that didn't... That didn't reach as far as Gorda Keegan. But um, um, in, in, in GAA, like, I was involved with a local club here and we got to a senior county final um, in 2014. And I do remember walking down the, the sideline in Parnell Park and hiding behind the floodlight and having a fag with about four minutes to go. There was nothing I could do then, you know? So uh, just the, the stress got to the better of me. But that was the only time I can remember. And like I'd say, even then, people would have been like, "Here, you're not really allowed to be doing that." No, 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 no. Well, I hid. I hid. No, you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't do it. Now you do it up the park. You know what I mean? But even even up the park, the, even in the club, there's been discussions about keeping keeping the area smoke free, and it should be. You know, like even at the doorway of the club, I, I go to the local GA club, and even at the doorway, that's where we smoke. You know, that's where we smoked, and it can be a bit. Um, what's the word? Well, it's not, not a good look for us, but it's a bit intimidating as well for people to come and there's five lads there smoking at the door, you know? Yeah. So, like, it, it has been the opposite to normalise. It has been demonised and it should be. Like, I remember smoking in offices. I remember I worked in offices and we smoked in them, you know, in the office. Could you imagine that? Your, your colleague there smoking a cigarette with no concern about whether you smoked or not, you know? It's just a done thing, so I it's a different world. I remember smoking on planes. When you think about that, like yeah. the, re the recycled stale air, like yeah, I can never remember sm smoking on planes. I can remember smoking on the top of a, a bus going into town, and that was horrible. You know, <laughs> on a rainy morning when there's very little air in the in the place anyway, and people are smoking. But I can't imagine on a plane it was very it was very pleasant. Um, I, my my dad would have been a, a coach and manager of um, the hurling team in a tie, and I remember. Uh, after training, Father Pat Mangan would come in. I don't think he's a priest anymore. But he would come in and he just he'd have one fag after training, and he'd be like, "I love this." You know, there was a real kind of like, "This is my treat." Having gone out there and tried to batter whoever it was in the back line and then absolved him of his sins, 
he'd come in and he'd sit in the dressing room and uh, and just have one cigarette and the whole place would be billowing with smoke but it was most it was the most normal thing in the world that nobody would would have gone you i mean everybody else is also breathing in your second hand smoke here father pat yeah yeah but he, he probably thought he was giving you something for nothing then you know what i mean <laughs> that's the way it was taught you know it wasn't secondary smoke it was you were just getting the benefit it was like it is it, it kind of takes over your life when you do smoke like you, when, wherever you are you're looking at the exits almost as if you're one of these characters from an assassin uh, a spy movie you're always looking for a way out <laughs> but you're always looking to go for a cigarette and see where you go and even going through airports or you know this airport you can go here or that airport you can go there the aviva you have to go down that way crow park it's easy you can go anywhere you want you know but it's just you, you're always thinking about it so i'm looking forward to having real life where it doesn't define my movements and what i'm doing and have I got enough fags for this match or enough fags for this night out? So, like you're with the Ireland team, there, and you can't be smoking. You, I, I mean, maybe there are secret areas in every stadium in the world, and you know them all. But surely that gets no. like if if you can just rid yourself of that craving, those nights will be much more enjoyable. Oh well, yeah. Well, to tell the truth, when you're really, really busy, like I'm, I'm working catering. When you're really busy, it doesn't enter into your head. You know, it's when you've nothing to do. So those nights, it doesn't work. Like I wasn't, I, you don't be one wondering where am I going to go for a fag when you're busy, you know? Yeah. When you've got a bit of downtime, you know? But no, definitely I was never looking for a way out of Wembley to, to go for a cigarette. Um, Fergus, you're a Jude's man, obviously. There's a, a picture that we have of yourself and Kevin Mack on Croke Park. You're in a steward's jersey, it looks like. Um, yeah, no, I used to do a bit of photography and Alan Milton let me in to take a few pictures. So um, I, I was, I... I used to go in and take a few pictures. Yeah, right. So if I was a Jude's PRO and I got into photography and one thing led to another and next thing you know, I'm on the sideline taking pictures of the All-Ireland Finals. So. Uh, very good. And uh, um, I presume you're not having a crafty fag <laughs> uh, crouched down with the rest of the photographers, are you? God, no. No, no. No, no. <laughs> no, we would go out at half time though. It was a, there was the tunnel there between Hill 16 and the Hogan Sand. You'd go out there and you'd have a crafty fag. Think of all the extra brain space you're going to have to uh, to be creative and, and not be worried about where the exits are from now on, Fergus. Absolutely, absolutely. I might, I might actually see more of, of these places of uh, things, you know. Yeah. Uh, I'm not thinking like like it would be. It would like if you went to a concert, you'd be thinking, where am I going to go for a fag here, you know? Or you know, so yeah. maybe even uh, like uh, yeah, things like cinema. You wouldn't enjoy the cinema as much, you know, because you wouldn't be able to smoke. So. Well, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to being a non-smoker, you know what I mean? Because it's been too long being a smoker. So um, I, I'm just looking forward to the, the, the health benefits. I actually saved a few bob there and I didn't know what I was going to do with it. So I got new tires for my car, you know? So <laughs> Wow, you must have been smoking a lot. <laughs> yeah. No, well, well, I got two new tires. Okay, again, well, but, still, so. I mean, tires ain't cheap. No, 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 but it was good to do that, you yeah. know. I was looking at drones online. I was going to buy a drone for myself, and then I said, no, listen, you're nearly 50 years of age, and you need new tires, get new tires. So. Get the drone. Like, get the drone. You're never going to get another one. This is the, it, it, the, the You can blame it on lockdown and uh, midlife crisis, and it's cheaper than most midlife crises, so go for the drone. Fergus, good well, stuff. Uh, we might talk a bit more about football next week, but uh, that was great. You're, you said you can't wait to be a non-smoker. 28 days in, though, you've got five times better chance of, um, of people who haven't quit yet. Uh, so best of luck with it, Fergus. Thanks a million. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Bobby. So we're going to talk with Fergus uh, every week over the next four weeks as he attempts to give up smoking with the HSE Quit Team. The HSE Quit Services provides personalised free support by phone, email, SMS and live chat. Smokers can call free 1-800-201-203 or visit quit.ie for stop smoking tips and resources. And a, remem a reminder, of course, if you quit smoking for 28 days, you're five times more likely to quit for good. Uh, we'll talk more with Fergus, who is the Republic of Ireland kit man, on next week's show. It is 14 minutes past nine this morning. If you want to get in touch with us, we'd love to hear from you. Um, 0879-180-180 is the number. Here's what's coming up on OTB Sports Radio today. <laughs> Leaders' Questions uh, is our Stuart Lancaster Leadership Series. The interview today is Ronan O'Gara at one o'clock. It is uh, Joe meeting Sherlock Nan. Uh, it's Mount Rushmore today is Mayo at three o'clock. At four o'clock, it's our retro panel with Tyrone GAA's Golden Days. That was class. At six o'clock, it's OTB Gold with Manu Petit. 
Yeah, Madame Petit was an interesting character. Um, maybe, not, maybe some of the stories that we'll tell aren't really appropriate for 14 minutes past nine this morning. And then live tonight from seven o'clock. Uh, up next on OTB AM, Simon Hughes. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Off the ball. <laughs> there was one player, <laughs> and um, I mean, him didn't get on. To go. I don't want to name him. So essentially, they ended up being like a, a pretty big fight in the show. But it's one of them ones where there was no one around to break it up. So, so I was kind of going, how long is this going to go on for? You know, and it was like, I don't really want to be doing this. I wish someone would come in now and just break this up. But obviously, two lads in the show are, you know, all greased up, rolling around. It. <laughs> it probably wasn't. It probably wasn't a pretty sight. Off the ball. Weeknights from seven and weekends from one. This is OTB Sports Radio. Live 24-7 on the OTB Sports app. Sean, what's that thing going around the garden? That is my, uh, our new husband. Husqvarna Automower. Automower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawnmower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so. Ah, no can do, love. Have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna Automower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie. Get ready for the Cheltenham Festival with the Boyle Sports app. With a special offer guaranteed on every race, every day of the festival, plus extra places on each-way bets over all four days. The Boyle Sports app has got you covered. Need to study up? Check out our Racing Post insights or watch our exclusive video previews with Cheltenham Gold Cup winning jockey Robbie Power. The Cheltenham Festival on the faster-than-ever Boyle Sports app. Boyle Sports. This is betting. Gamble responsibly. See gamblingcare.ie. 18+. plus. OTB AM With Gillette Put your best face forward With our new and improved razors 16 minutes past 9 this morning Here on OTB AM I'm delighted to say Simon Hughes of The Athletic Is with us as we talk about Liverpool uh, Good morning to you Simon How are you? I'm alright yeah Not too bad um, What's going on? What do you think is going on? <laughs> well I mean Where do you start? I mean it's not It's not just one reason Is it why Liverpool Are in this position? Um a lot of people keep asking me, you know, there must be something sort of behind the scenes. The, you know, there must have been a, you know, the, the, there must be some sort of conflict at the club. You know, I don't detect that at all. I, I just don't. I just think that a lot of the things that people have spoken about are the major problems at the moment. You know, com combination of things, got dating all the way back until the summer, really for me, where. Okay, I appreciate a lot of, uh, you know, each team didn't have a proper pre-season, but given that the Liverpool team under Jurgen Klopp, is, is, a lot of it's been, a lot of the success has been related to, I'd say, availability and the fitness of the players, uh, first and foremost, above anything else. And um, since the summer, really, that's, that's been a problem. I, mean, went into, I know every club went into the season with, with players that were missing, um, but I think particularly for Liverpool, a team that... In the key areas, they don't change the position. They, they don't change. You don't rotate so much. It's only really the midfield that you sort of rotated in previous seasons. And I think full-back areas haven't been as productive because the players are tired up front. Again, the you know the, it's quite clear what's what's what the problem is there. Um, and then defensively, so it's, it's a structural problem. Confidence has eroded from their injuries before that. You know, it's all the things that people have seen, but it's. Um, it's pretty dramatic, a dramatic fall, which is sort of rooted, as far as I'm concerned, in in the summer months when um, when the you know they, they weren't able to do the, the sort of preparation they would normally do for the season. I think I've seen Klopp get blamed for not changing his style of play and not anticipating the fact that post lockdown there was going to be a knock on on the team's fitness for this season. That's definitely one way of reading what's happened. There is another way which would look at how he managed to maintain the squad's brilliance over that two and a half year period where they uh, won the Champions League, finished second, sorry, uh, finished, uh, reached the Champions League final, finished second, win the Champions League, win the league, and now they're at this point where that tiny squad in retrospect massively, yeah. I don't know if it's massively yeah. overachieved because they were so good, but th I, I see these two things as kind of slightly being in conflict. You can't give him crap for not changing things around and then go, well, he should have known this was going to happen. Look at, look at what he's just delivered. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think he's not he's not above criticism. Um, you know, I, I thought the, the Fulham performance was was alarming. It was the first time I've seen a Liverpool team under his management sort of felt like he threw through the towel in a little bit for me. Um, you know, Klopp wasn't particularly uh, animated on the touchline. I wasn't at the game, but speaking to people who were there, you, you know, he, he was pretty subdued, I think. So it's clearly, it's obviously getting to him. Um, but, you know, I think this is this is uncharted territory for Jurgen Klopp, really. I mean, he's obviously had great success at Mainz, relatively speaking. Incredible success at Dortmund. Um but the tasks in those jobs have been slightly different and the, the, the sort of working environments and the challenges around them were different to Liverpool. So in the, each of those clubs, he'd have players taken away from him without, without him really having a say in it. Liverpool have reached a point now where, you know, in theory, they're the club the players would want to join. Um, and it's up to him really to, to pick and choose when, when you know, a, a player's time is up. So he, he's, he's experiencing something quite new, I think. And, hasn't really been spoken about too much. You know, the, the, the job that he faces at Liverpool in 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 2021 is very different to the one that he had in Dortmund after the Champions League final, for example, when they lost, um, you know, they lost a couple of players that summer. So it's, um, I, I do think it is going to come a point where, you know, his judgment's going to have to come into play, where he's going to have to decide whether some of these players do have to move on. I mean, I, I do think that, Past that process has already started because we've seen Curtis Jones pushed into the first team. We've seen Diogo Jota signed and having a, having an impact. I think both of those players you could say have had you know really good seasons. I mean Curtis Jones for me I think has been the, the bright spot in, in a difficult season. I know he sort of has a, a few off games, but you sort of accept, expect that for a young player. But he's he has influenced some big games as well, you know, which is a really encouraging sign. But you know, I, I, you sort of do get the impression that, you know, particularly the front three, so much is expected of them. For me, you know, for me, hasn't been at it. You know, is is, is, um, is it, there's a problem with his first touch. I think what some of his running stats are so high because he's chasing after his first touch all the time, some of the times. And um, I think he needs to, you can't, you can't have an argument where you say for, for many years, Firmino is the key player in this team, which allows the team to get up the pitch. But then when the team's not playing and he's not performing in that, that it's not his fault. I'm not saying it's one player's fault, but when, when the centre forward has that pressing responsibility and he's not he's not quite doing it to the same level, it does have a knock-on effect further back back the pitch. <laughs> and let's not forget further back the pitch, you've got lots of problems in terms of the availability. So it's a structural problem, a confidence problem. Um, there's a lot for Jürgen Klopp to solve, I think. Uh, you mentioned Klopp being subdued recently. Do you think that he saw this coming when, before Christmas, he was getting into a bit of a conflict with Des Kelly on BT about the resting of game, resting of players and the, the pile-up of games? That 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 seemed like the the almost Jose when uh, things weren't going so well for him at Chelsea, for example, coming out and fighting before Christmas. He probably saw what was about to happen, did he? I, I'd agree with that, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's... It, his team, as we know, as we've already discussed, is, is a team that's based on high energy, uh, which requires availability, and is going to have a lot of wear and tear on the players, which is why he knows that it's important to have those discussions about the number of games that Liverpool play in terms of... Um, or the, the number of games that when they're playing. I can understand why he wants that argument. It's, it's obviously, you know, in self-interest, but which manager doesn't speak in self-interest? Equally, I do think he he sort of he realizes as well that, that you know the it's not just Liverpool's performances this season. I, I would argue that you know that being the, the quality of the Premier League football this year has been been reflective of the pandemic and the the challenges around that. I can't think of too many games which have sort of blown me away in terms of the, the level of quality in there. So I think he has he just has a broader point. You know that the you know you're asking players to play to play to play. Um, and it's it's affecting the quality of the football, but equally, I think it, affect, it particularly affects his team because because of the requirements, because of the style of the football that Liverpool play. So yeah, I mean, he, he's argued. I mean, when when he spoke about um, these issues to Des Kelly and and to various other people, this was nothing new. He, he'd spoken for 
for many years about this, about his three years of burnout. Um, I did think at the time, you know, that the perhaps he's got a responsibility to remind Liverpool's owners of this as well, because you know that they go on these pre-season tours, which are okay, very uh, lucrative in terms of the money that they make. But um, you can't have it both ways, can you? Uh, so I think um, I think he did see it coming. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Was Thiago's signing supposed to change the style of the play enough to ease some of the wear and tear, or is that an oversimplification? Yeah, I, I don't think it was built to to change the style of play. I mean, I, I think there was a feeling when he when he signed that he would be able to um, to vary the style of play when needed to change the pace of the style of play as well. Equally, you know, let, let's not forget Juan Alzheimer's contract situation. I think it was a preemptive move against his. Uh, well, it seems like an inevitable, inevitable departure now. Um, I mean, I've got some sympathy with Thiago because he came into the club, um, obviously contracted coronavirus, which didn't allow him to make a, the sort of start that he'd want to make, and then had, you know, he's out for two and a half months um, due to a bad injury, and then has come back into the team um, when it's it's on its down a little bit. So it's difficult. It, no matter what stands of the football you are in, in, in those sorts of circumstances, I think it's always going to be quite hard to sort of put your impression on the team. Uh, not, not not just a team that's sort of out of form, a team that's not functioning in the same way it's, it normally would do. Um, I, I think I, I would say that, the, you know, the, the, the Goodison derby against Everton was, was his best performance. And it's no coincidence that in that game, he was. He had Jordan Henderson and Fabinho alongside him for 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 bulk, you know for a big part of that game, um, and he performed very well. And so, I mean, there's not really any Liverpool player I think comes through this season with, with a great deal of credit, other than Curtis Jones and Andy Robertson. I think has, has had a good season, but I think in, in in recent weeks, months, I think the the lack of opportunity to to be able to have a rest, which Simakas was brought in for, of course, has shown as well. Are you concerned, Simon, that the hierarchy at Liverpool, the owners of Liverpool, might not be willing to make the correct decisions this summer to ensure that Liverpool get back to win the Premier League or at least challenge for the Premier League next season? Well, uh, I found the, the newspaper reports in England's interest in, over the last couple of days, you know, the suggestion that they are going to back Jürgen Klopp. I mean, it, it, it was said that there's a feeling that the, the team doesn't need an overhaul. There's a feeling that if Liverpool can get the players fit again, um, the key players fit and have the appropriate appropriate amount of rest over the summer, which is going to be interesting given there's a European Championship. The, the next season, the, the you know these these have a much better chance of getting closer to where they want to be. Um, I, I think that the, you know they're going to need to make two 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 top quality signings really in in certain departments. I think central defence is still a glaring uh, the glaring problem. Um, and then further up the pitch, I think there needs to be more support in attack as well. Um, and you'd like to think that the, you know the midfields would have um, players playing in the correct positions um, when when some sense of normality resumes. So I I can understand the question marks around it because um, in terms of the way the owners have run the club, they've they've run the club over. Uh, you know, since since they they, they came to England, uh, came to the Premier League, and, and and started owning Liverpool on real terms. You know, in terms of the buying and selling and the trading that they've done. Um, so they're gonna. Um, you can't have it both ways. You can't sort of praise them for, for doing that, and then suddenly it sounds like the sort of suggestion there might be a little bit of a departure from that that that, that process in the summer to get Liverpool closer to where they want to be. But I, I mean, I also think that there's a one thing that's sort of been not really been spoken about too much in the in the discussion about why Liverpool weren't able to go and sign players. They had three players last summer that they did want to sell, but they had expectations of uh, revenues coming in of around £60 million pound for those players. And, you know, in a pandemic, it's difficult to judge what value is. But I think that had some of those players been sold, I'm talking about Sheridan Shakiri here, um, you know uh, Harry Wilson um, and possibly Divock Origi as well. Um, if, if those players had, had been sold, then possibly Liverpool might have had the funding to go and 
go and get the central half that he did need. Um, you know, in, in the in the in the January transfer window. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a big a lot of pressure on Michael Edwards this summer, the sporting director, because he's going to have to trade well to to create uh, the real financial environment that allows Liverpool to to go and and sign the players that will make them a team that is uh, capable of finishing higher than eighth, put it that way. He's been brilliant so far, and that's kind of maybe an underrated part of that whole jigsaw. You have the totemic manager whose style perfectly aligns with what the fans want. You have incredible success in the transfer market, and particularly in terms of realising value for squad players or for players who probably didn't particularly fit the style. And then most of the incomings have been uh, a success. Certainly the, the big ticket ones, which you needed to change the culture of the team and to change the culture of the dressing room, they work straight away. That's the goalkeeper and the, the centre back I'm obviously talking about. I mean, some of the other ones haven't been massively successful. And Jota looks like it's a, a good signing, we'll see. But that's a lot of pressure to keep hitting everything all the time. Most of the world's big super clubs have massive failures along the way. But because they're so big, you kind of they trundle along. Like if you look at the amount of money that Man City have wasted, the amount of money Manchester United have wasted over the last decade. So yeah. that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, yeah. There is a lot, there's a lot more pressure at Liverpool because of the the economic um, landscape in which they operate. Um, they can't really afford to have many sorts of high profile mistakes. I mean, you, you mentioned there that there are other clubs that have spent in advance of 40, 50 million pounds, 60 million pounds on players that just haven't worked. If, if that happens at Liverpool, there's a consequence. I, I think Naby Keita potentially could be one of those players where it hasn't worked out. He obviously spent a lot of money to get him, bring him to Liverpool. He's now at the end of his third season, struggling for fitness. Um, I mean, it'd be pretty spectacular from here, you know, if, if he was able to go and become a regular in the in the first team um, because three seasons is a long time. So, yeah, I mean, I think there is more pressure on Michael Edwards, but um, with the pressure that, that, that does come natural expectation, I think his I think his records in the early years was when he, he ne didn't necessarily have the, the title to go with the responsibility that he had. I think his record in that time wasn't so great. I think that was partly as well because you know a difference of opinion with. Brendan Rodgers, for example, about the profile of the player that Liverpool was trying to sign. I think Jurgen Klopp makes his job easier because uh, he's got a very clear idea of who he wants, and yet he, he is also willing to, to listen to, to, to the people um, who are in control of the, the transfer uh, system at Liverpool. So, you know, Salah will be an example of that. Jurgen Klopp wanted to sign... Julian Brandt, he was his pre preference at the time, and, and um, Dave Fallows, who is essentially the chief scout, was like, no, we should really go and get Salah. And that, that's been proven to be a really smart move and an example of when it works at Liverpool, how effective it can be. But, you know, the, the, the bottom line is, you know, that Liverpool will need to sell some players this summer to, to, to boost the coffers and allow them to, to bring some new players in. And I think it's an interesting summer ahead because, as I said, nobody really knows what value looks like at the moment, I think. Mm. And I think the people who who quickest appreciate what a good deal is and are able to operate according to, to the new financial sort of um, environment of football, which is going, it is going to take a hit because of, because of everything that's going on. Um, I think those teams will be ahead of other teams. So, yeah, I mean, it's 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 unrelenting at Liverpool, really. You know, they, he, he, I accept Michael Edwards had a very good sort of five years, really, since he and Klopp's come, but the challenge never stops, does it? So he's going to have to be very quick in this summer. Um, and I think the pressure, as I agree with you, I think the pressure on him is probably greater than sporting directors at other clubs where he can afford to make a lot more... Uh, a lot more mistakes, I think. Simon, great to have you with us again. Cheers. Thanks. Simon Hughes there from The Athletic giving us some thoughts on the Liverpool scenario. We'll obviously react to their performance tonight in the second leg of their Champions League game and keep you up to date on it. And you can hear live updates, of course, on the radio show this evening from 7. Uh, tomorrow, the Six Nations show is live. Johnny Murphy and Johnny Beatty 
are going to join Neil from 12 o'clock on all of our social channels. You can get that there. And a reminder, of course, OTBAM live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. On tomorrow morning's show, I should tell you as well, we're going to hear from Andy Burke from BBC Scotland ahead of the Six Nations game this weekend. League of Ireland director Mark Scanlon joins us. We'll have TV picks with Sue Murphy and the Cheltenham countdown continues. Ratchets up really with Tom Malone. Right now we're going to bring you Eamon O'Neill and Nora Stapleton who spoke with Joe on the uh, PM show last night about the importance of keeping Irish girls and women involved in sport. So uh, just to give people a sense of the methodology here, it's always interesting, how do we compile these stories, uh, studies, or what's the best way to do it? I mean, I was looking through the full report and there was like a lot of interview processes, I think with 31 girls, different parts of the country, and interviews with, you know, a teacher, a parent, or a sports provider as well, or you got the girls together in pairs and interview them that way as well. That was the way you tried to get a sense of where they are in their own life and, and how sport fits into it. That was the, the general plan. Yeah, you've pretty much summarised it quite well there. And um, I think the big thing with those interviews, there was a lot of online work where Women in Sports, the UK company that you mentioned, they tracked the girls' activity online and they encouraged them to, you know, to do blogs and to post images of what they see sport is. Um, and that was really interesting. So a lot of the comments and quotes that were taken from the girls, they were all things that they posted themselves online. So it really gave us an idea of their lives and what they do day to day and then their attitude towards sport. So that was a big thing for us, like what's their attitude towards sport? What are the barriers, the challenges that they experience? What's important in their lives? And then what can we actually do about it? Um, women in sport, to give a bit of context there, they have, they've done this type of work before. So they've done it with teenage girls in the UK. So. Um, we were able to draw on a lot of previous work that they've done and then we worked with a consultant, an Irish consultant firm who linked us up with the girls here. So that's what brought the Irish context, or, uh, context and then obviously the other stakeholders. So it was really interesting. There was a bit of compare and contrast with teenage girls in the UK, mm. but by and by it was very similar. Um, I think maybe the main difference was in the UK, teenage girls have more a different relationship with their parents in particular their mother compared to Ireland, the biggest uh, relationship factor in Ireland is the teenage girls and the relationship they have with their friends uh, was the most important thing, whereas in the UK it was with their mum. So that was the main difference. And look, we've, we'll probably go through some of the stuff we found, but for us, it, it wasn't just about getting research, but looking to see how do we map research with the insights that we're gathering? And then how do we develop a resource or tools in order to help sports or help people make it make a difference with the information that we find because quite often i find we do all this research and then nobody knows what to do with it so we're trying to take it one step further there's loads in the report like for instance you're you're, you're trying to get a sense of where teenage girls we're talking about them and the report makes this point like it's one homogenous group who think and act in exactly the same way there's obviously huge uh, variations i'm sure amongst many different individuals but in broad terms Generation Z, four plus hours on the phone a day. Uh, preoccupations include everything with, you know, obsessions with selfies and appearance is a huge issue at the moment. There's online bullying and some uh, girls limiting their online use as a result. There's increased academic pressure, which is, you know, I, I think a, a, a generational thing as well. Each generation as we go by has more of a pressure, I think, to perform academically. A uh, sense of belonging, just bored is kind of a thing as well. Reasons for not getting involved in sport then, no friends involved, no friends involved was a big reason. Uh, fear of embarrassment was another reason. Uh, schoolwork pressure was another reason. A couple gave a reason that there's just nothing out there they enjoy. And the most powerful uh, barrier, Nora, was I'm not good enough. As in, I'm not of a sufficient standard to play with you know, my, uh, the others my age at whatever the chosen sport is. So maybe, and that's often based on a limited experience starting out. So, you know, maybe they went to football training twice, weren't that good, didn't enjoy it, and, and pretty quickly concluded, I'm not good enough to play this sport, so I'm not going to. You, you said that was the most powerful barrier you found. That, yeah, that and the I'm not sporty and the tagline or the kind of perception of what they think sporty is. So that I'm not good enough, like it, it's, such a shame, isn't it? And it was surprising in a way that that's what came through really strong. Um, you said there that, you know, it could be girls going to football and trying it out a couple of times and leaving. It's not even so much that, you know, it was um, a team sports. 
I suppose certainly there was a strong voice from the girls where they had a negative experience seemingly within the team sports. Um, but we all know like team sports in Ireland, they're fantastic. The sport is fantastic. So it's not to say that it's all because of team sports. Um, that's not the case. But those girls who labeled themselves as not good enough, um, it could have been that the the competition element or the challenge that they were experiencing within those sports maybe wasn't what they wanted to experience or they felt that they weren't good enough to be part of the team. It was embarrassing then to try and train with the team mm. when the team were more focused on winning matches or, you know, maybe getting to a higher level of performance on the pitch, whereas they were there because it comes back to obviously the social elements. They were there with their friends. They enjoyed it. They liked being challenged because, you know, girls do like being challenged when they're involved in sport. Um, but it was at a level that they felt I'm a weakness now in the team. And then they felt like they were being judged by their teammates. And so rather than go through all that, they just left. So that was a big thing around the leaving or the dropout. Um, and it's only one area like that. No judgment um, is one area. And how do we get rid of that no judgment or that feeling of I'm not good enough um, is a big it's going to be a huge challenge, but I think it's really great that we've identified that and we can talk about it. Emer, secondary school teacher, what are you seeing on the ground? Is it single sex school or both, Emer? Um, I'm in a mixed school, yeah. So, um, but I myself went to an all girls school. Um, <clears throat> to be honest, you know, listening, it's like, it's funny because like I don't have to have even seen any of this research, but I can concur with the results just by what I see with my own kids in school. Um, I think the first issue probably is that in primary school, when you're getting the foundation for the prereq for a lot of skills and to be able to, let's say, play team sports, because in primary school level over here, we don't actually have physical education teachers teaching PE. It's just, you know, the classroom teacher. And it's the same if you think of anything, right? So you don't like maths or you don't like history but if you have a really good maths teacher or a really good history teacher you, you get the sense of confidence i suppose because you're learning more and you start to enjoy the subject a bit more i think the same goes for the likes of pe so if you have a primary school teacher let's say in fifth class that you know just really isn't into sport and you know i suppose pe consists of maybe rolling out a ball and you have a bit of crack in the yard, like you're not actually learning any fundamental skills there as such. And there is a primary school curriculum, but a lot of the time what I'm seeing is that it's not actually being followed because when I get students into the secondary level, I find that they don't have the prereq skills that they need to actually access the secondary school curriculum. So what I'm finding is I'm having to dip into the primary school curriculum and come right back into you know just throwing catching even running fundamentals and um, before I can even get into team sports or anything like that um like in the states so I'm qualified to teach k through 12 which would be from primary all the way through to secondary because in the states in the primary school level you have a qualified PE teacher that's gone to college for four years and has a degree in you know what they're doing and I think that's a huge deficit that we have in this country so what i see too is like a, a student that comes to me in secondary school a girl that is quite proficient it's actually because of something outside of school and then that kind of is a bit of a snowball effect because it kind of de depends on maybe your socioeconomic background whether or not maybe you can afford to do extracurricular activities outside of school or like for instance my son like a, a lot of it is to do with having that time to even be able to do it like you know he has training sessions three times a week and thankfully my husband is really good at making sure he gets there to all those sessions so if you don't have kind of that family backbone pushing it as well and being there to make sure that the kids get to their sessions um or financially that you can afford to even pay for the outside sessions kids by the time they're 12 and 13 are so behind those that have actually maybe done a sport outside of school and that's where that massive deficit I think comes and then the fear of not being good enough not being picked being one of the huge issues I see in PE um, and of course that not being sporty but I think we need to change that concept of I'm not sporty and think more about 
health and well-being. So to maybe not use that word sporty anymore because like sport covers such an array of things and females in general studies kind of show that they do prefer individual sports as opposed to team sports and so the likes let's say of you know dance aerobics um athletics uh gymnastics swimming and in PE in Ireland, those subjects are very rarely covered in the PE curriculum because we don't have access a lot of the time. Um, and also maybe a fear of the subject. So itself, like, so swimming, I'd say there's maybe 5% of schools, if even that in the country that have access to actual swimming as a part of their PE curriculum. Um, not to mention gymnastics. I know a lot of PE teachers would feel a little bit tentative to go into that area because there is such a high risk of injury and you really need to be quite, you know, well educated when it comes to gymnastics, even do it. And then the topic of dance, that's another one, you know, because you think, oh, well, the kids like, especially if you're in a mixed school, now the boys will be, they won't like to do this. So we just won't do it. The lads will be messing then in the class and she will just scratch the whole thing. We won't do dance. And so then again, the girls miss out again on something that they probably would have really liked. So like within my, my class, like we do, we try to do new things like yoga, Pilates, bring in meditation and try and and get them to find a love for something and understand that walking is a sport hiking is a sport you know going out and uh, riding your bike is a sport you know that you know you don't have to think of it all the time necessarily as a team sport where you need to be getting physical and you know and i'm not saying that there aren't loads of girls out there that love that aspect me being one of them you know that was but it's just not always for everyone so i think it's so important that we're not finding that drop off you know, and we're only really ensuring that those team sports kids are being facilitated for, but individual sports, not so much. Yes. Well, look, you've really touched on something that blew up on the show maybe a month or two ago. We had Professor Niall Moyna on talking about our general fitness, and he was talking about all ages, but certainly when we got into school going age. There was a UCC study recently which showed that the basics of, you know, physical literacy, be it throwing a ball, bouncing a ball, catching, rolling, knowing how to fall, running, all these motor skills that should be mastered early on. When they're arriving to you, Imer, at 12 years of age, they're nowhere near. And so your experience tallies with that a survey completely. And so, you know, it's fairly obvious probably what's happened in that society has changed so much. And the days of like, go out and I'll see you in five hours and unsupervised play and climbing a tree and, you know, doing different things with your mates in urban areas, certainly that has all declined massively and it's not coming back. And what we're left with, is a national school syllabus where, as Emer says, it's a you know real lottery as to the quality of national school, primary school teaching you're on the receiving end of. And even if it's good, it's only an hour a week, you know, and there's no dedicated PE teacher. So really, I mean, if, if we're looking at this um, study and it's saying that teenage girls by the age of 12, 13, 14 are writing themselves off as not sporty, it's too late then. So. I mean, Emer, the fairly simple solution is we need a complete overhaul of our national school PE curriculum. Like, one hour a week, you know, th this is a country where it gets dark early, where, you know, as I said, kids, kids aren't out anymore. I mean, really, physical literacy, it's one of the most important things any of us can learn. It should be an hour a day. And I would have, when I was teaching PE in the States, my kids had PE every single day. They had an hour of PE every day, every class, one hour every single day right that's why when i came back here you know people ask what other subject do i have and i said i don't have another subject because in the states having a physical education degree is a big thing and it's important and you will get all of your hours of PE. whereas here you know the kids like i'm looking at my school and i fought for it that my kids would get a double class of pe week um, and even with that like that's kind of unheard of in most schools most schools like that it is just one hour and then come fifth and sixth year it becomes optional so they don't even have to do it mm. Nor that's what jumps out to me, I must say. I mean, when, when these teenage yeah. girls, 12, 13, 14 years of age, as I said, are writing themselves off as just not sporty, it's not for me. It's way too late there. Like, we're going to have to get stuck into this national school situation very quickly, be it a, a designated PE teacher who looks after three or four schools in a local area. Yeah, I wouldn't um, disagree with Emer's points there. I think they're spot on and, and your own. Um, that's probably a lot, like, that is a long-term approach, isn't it? 
And I think... Is it, though? Is it? Like, I, I, well, genuinely, well, is that not like a... You know, because we're, we're going to have various plans, five-year plans, ten-year plans, on we go. This would strike me as something government could do, you know, in, in real politic time overnight. Like, within the next three, four, five years, if there was a real concerted effort, I don't see why we couldn't have the national school PE syllabus completely overhauled. Like, I, do, I don't actually see why that's long term. I think the no, the decision doesn't have to be long term, but I think seeing the effects of it. So if we're looking at the girls now who are the, the 13, 14, 15 year olds, you know, it's what, five years or three years since they left primary school and those fundamental movement skills, the laying down period of those is kind of between the age up to under 12. Um, but the age of eight, nine, ten is essential as well. So, like I completely agree with fundamental movement skills and physical literacy. I worked for the GA where that was a huge part of all the coaching that we did in primary school, running, jumping, throwing, catching. So, I'm a full supporter of it. I think you know that we have to look as well that in the report here, it's not just about their ability, but even they talk an awful lot about opportunities as well and lack of awareness and opportunities. So. Teenage girls are saying they want to try new things, but they don't know where to try them. So they don't only talk about their own abilities in sport. Um, and I think that's a really important thing that we have to acknowledge because not every girl is, you know, wanting to join a sport because they want to be, they want to win medals or play for Ireland or represent their country or their county. And we have to be okay with that because there should be a place for every single girl to participate. And I think we need to, and like 100%, what we have to do is focus on how do we ensure the opportunities exist where there's more adventure, more excitement. They've said to us they want to do more activities outdoors. They want to do more hiking, climbing, um, off-road biking, dance, all these type of activities. And so like our key aim here now has to be how do we deliver that? And would the state, and also, would the, sorry to interrupt, would the state not be the obvious answer? Because even there was a 17 year old girl and it was such a sad comment to read. She said, uh, we're Northsiders. I have a few friends in sports, that, but they're from well off families. It's not the culture here for girls to be into sports. You know, like the social aspect of this is significant as well. It would strike me, Nora, at national school level, if you have six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old girls, 11 year old girls, trying out those different things you know like an hour at national school a day it can be dance it can be a walk it can be you know a, any number of things which might uh, catch their interest but that's a way that's a catch-all way to look after urban areas rural areas uh, different social classes is that not the quick way to short circuit this problem i think it can be one of the ways okay. um, possibly and then i think you even have to look at um, additional interventions in first year, for example, in secondary school, because, well, you know, when you look at primary school kids, they, there's activity levels there and th those are measured. And, you know, when we talk about the national, um, the national targets, it's all about 60 minutes a day or one hour a day. And yes, not enough primary school children are doing that, that amount. But when they go to secondary school, we know that there's a huge drop off there. And um, so it isn't just primary school, we then have to look at, okay, first year and secondary school, what interventions have to go and maybe you continue some of the ideas that are discussed here into secondary school for the first, second year. Um, but again, as we've touched on, it has to be more about other opportunities. Like when we looked at the most popular or the most common sports played in secondary school for girls, it was basketball, soccer, uh, football, like GA football and mogi. So all team sports. So is it that the girls wanted to play those sports? Or are those the sports that we gravitate towards and they're the only ones that we offer? Um, and so I think, you know, when I say long term, short term, in the short term, these are the conversations I think we need to be having. Um, when we're when we have secondary school girls now, what are we going to offer them next week? What are we going to offer them next year? Because they're saying to us, like they understand the benefits of exercise, they know it's good for their mental health. Um, they know they want to be involved. Emer mentioned the individual versus team sports. The individual sports, they gravitate towards um, more often, certainly, but they actually want to do those individual sports in a in a group setting because they still want to be with people, uh, but they just don't like the yeah. intensity yeah. that comes from team quite often.
Again, sorry, I'm, 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 I'm making the same point over and over, so I'll make it for the last time. Again, everything you've said, I just think a national school setting is perfect, and it gives them a base when they head into secondary school where they've, a, you know, more of a confidence and all the things Emer is talking about come to the fore then. Emer, do you want to come in on, on any of this? I totally understand what uh, Nora's saying there as far as, you know, what to do with secondary schools because you have a lot of different things that come into play when it comes to secondary school level. So let's say the skill-wise was on par and they were proficient and ready to go. Then you have a lot of, I don't want to look stupid in front of the lads. I don't want to sweat. I don't, I'm afraid of how I look. I'm my body. Um, there's a lot of then, those issues that then start coming into play as well that need you know kind of they need to be looked at yeah. and ultimately like that i know the, the most important thing is not that they go on and play for ireland or for their county or anything what you want is for them to find something that they can fall in love with that they can have so when they're having a bad day that they use it as a positive outlet you know and i think it's that's a really great thing to have also even going on to third level education you know that you can find a group so quickly because you, you like to walk so you, you now you've got instant friends in your walking group um and just a lovely way to keep yourself um healthy and fit and and mentally in a good place and again that is is so important that we we generate that within that secondary school level i think mm. that's where they really will get that love and understanding because they may have brought some negative feelings about exercise and activity from primary school but there's still a ch an opportunity to change that in the secondary school level as well. It's interesting, Emer, you mentioned that thing of body image and I don't want to sweat and I'm conscious about how I look. That wasn't in this survey. Now, I don't know, was there embarrassment about mentioning that? And But but that is a reality, because I expected to see that in the survey and it wasn't a big team at all. But you're, are you seeing that on the ground? Oh, I see that in the classroom. Uh, every day, that's, that's a thing. And I know when I first came back to Ireland from America, um, I did a lot of sub work and when I would come into the class, I'd see all the girls just sitting over across against the, the wall, you know, on the benches and the lads would come up to me into the front and I'd take attendance and I'd say like, girls, well, you know, why are you sitting over there? And they'd say, well, you know, Mr. or Miss, whoever, like, doesn't, we don't have to do PE. And I'm like, what do you mean? And they'd be in their uniforms and they're like, oh, and then it would, all the excuses would come. I ha I don't have my gear. I have a note from my mom. And, and that would be a huge thing. Like that parents would literally be writing notes to get their kids out of having to even do PE. Or if their friend that day is not doing PE, suddenly they don't have their gear. And, and a lot of that happens with the girls, but not so much ever with the lads. Mm. Um, but for me, I would say, well, you don't have your gear. No problem. You can play in your skirt. Come on in. And it does bring in loads of aspects because it is, a little bit unfair again if you're in a uniform school they are wearing skirts and if they don't bring their gear but i noticed that the more i, I said that you can play in your skirt then the next day at pe you better believe they had their gear you know and i think it's just a, a, it's a culture within a school and it's as a PE teacher your expectations for your kids and i think also coming at from as a female to female to female as the PE teacher you know the well, uh, miss, you know, um, I'm, I'm on my cycle this month. I say, well, that's actually really good. Just free exercise, getting up and around will really help if you have cramps or anything like that. So that squash it, squashes that straight away, you know. Mm. And also just that I, you know, as a woman, you'd say, this is really good for you. Like, I can see loads of possible um, potentials for, you know, happiness in your life if you can find some area and activity that you'll enjoy. And I can even just explain some of my, my background and stuff to, to get them on board. So I do think also it's important that they have access to seeing more females that have um, not only just success in, in an actual career or pro career or playing mm. for their country, but just somebody who, let's say, like I have a friend that would not have liked PE. She was the one that was always forgetting her gear, but now she does CrossFit and she's a personal trainer and she absolutely loves that individual side of working on her body and working herself. And it gives her such a release from a stressful day-to-day -day life yeah. that she would never realize that she had that love and she didn't until she was in adulthood. But it would have been great for her to have found that in secondary school and had that the whole way through and all through college, you know? Mm. so. There's a lot of work to be done in the secondary level as well. And yes, to make sure. That they're for that's, uh, it's really interesting. I might come in there on the yes, role model yes. side of things because um, we we talked to them about role models and they kind of said, you know, the role models that we tend to see in sport are the really sporty role models. And they're like, but sure, I'm never going to be like that. So 
you know, when we show all these fantastic images and posters and interviews with Irish athletes, county players, we're talking, we're preaching to the converted and, and we're talking to the younger girls or the young adults or the teenage girls who want to and aspire to be that, but we're not talking to the inactive girls. So for us, that's like, right, we need to completely change um, yeah. who the influencers are for these girls and yes. who we get to talk to them and who they're going to resonate with. And, and like they came into the whole micro and macro trends as well. So they'd be more interested in listening to someone like the examples you used there, Emer, but listen to someone who's into sustainable fashion and now enjoys running or, you know, is now exercising and doing X, Y, and Z. They're the people who they're going to um, resonate with. Yeah. And Nora, I'm right in saying that the idea of body image and not wanting to sweat and all the things Emer mentioned that she has seen and I kind of expected to see in this survey, they didn't jump out massively in this survey. What's your sense of that? Was there an embarrassment raising those issues, do you think? Or were they there and maybe just not reflected as much in the report? Um, I think it's the latter because when we went back to the consultants, we asked them that because we were like, that's a bit weird. It kind of, it doesn't match a lot about a lot of what we know. So um, they did say that, which was even more surprising, they asked the girls about exercising with boys and they kind of shrugged their shoulders and they're like, yeah, that's fine. Right. If it's something that, um, if it's something new, exciting and something they've never tried before, it wasn't an issue for them because I would have always been the type of person, even, you know, when we talk about PE and secondary schools, I don't understand schools that have boys and girls doing PE together. I think it's just so off-putting for the girls. Um, but yet these girls were saying, no, like if I was to rock down somewhere and that was, if it was, you know, a, an activity where it was fun, exciting, there was a social element, like they all want to be able to put it on Instagram afterwards, all these things come into play and they would do it with the boys. So we're still unsure of that one. <laughs> OTB. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. 